My name is Kate O'Connor, and I am the chair of the Vermont Nuclear Decommissioning Citizen Advisory Panel, which is the meeting you are all at tonight. And I want to officially um, call to order the May 25th, 2017 meeting of the panel. What I'm going to do for some of you who may, this may be your first meeting, I want to explain a little bit about what the panel is and um, what we do. We are a 19-member panel that was formed by the legislature back in 2014 when Entergy announced that they would be closing Vermont Yankee. Um, we have been meeting since September 2014, and in that time, I think we've had 25 or 26 meetings, so we've been meeting pretty much on a regular basis. The legislature gave us um, a series of duties, but the one that is really most relevant for tonight is that we're, we are to serve as a conduit for public information and education and to encourage community involvement in all matters related to the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee. Uh, before I go over the agenda, I want all of our panel members um, to introduce themselves. We have a diverse group. I was um, appointed by Governor Shumlin as a citizen member of the panel. So Chris, do you want to start that on your end? Uh, Chris Campany, when Chris Campany, Wyndham Regional Commission. Uh, David Dean, citizen uh, appointee by the Speaker of the House. Mark McDonald, I represent the Vermont Senate in um, this panel. Uh, good evening, I'm Steve Skibniowski, uh, representing the town of Vernon, um, and uh, um, nominated by the uh, Vernon Board of Selectmen. David Andrews representing the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers and uh, representing the past and present employees of Vermont Yankee. Jim Tokovich, I'm an appointee from the Senate President Pro Tem. Martin Langevelle, a citizen member appointed by Governor Schumann. Jim Matho, also a citizen member appointed by the President Pro Tem. Derek Jordan, citizen member appointed by Shep Smith. Bill Irwin, representing the Agency of Human Services. I work for the Department of Health, Radiological and Toxicological Sciences. And I'm uh, Riley Allen. I'm Deputy Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Public Service. Uh, I'm here sitting in for Commissioner June Tierney, who's out of the country. Good evening, I'm Mike McKay. I'm representing Entergy. And good evening, I'm Jack Boyle, also representing Entergy. I'm the decommissioning director at Vermont Yankee. Um, we're gonna have you guys, you folks introduce yourselves in a minute. Um, this is an official meeting of our panel. And tonight we have our special guests, which are representatives from Entergy and North Star and the NRC. And they're gonna be, as you know, on the agenda for later. Um, the representatives from the NRC are here to take public comment on the license transfer, which is the sale from Entergy to North Star, and North Star's um, post shutdown <coughs> decommissioning, I, decommissioning activities report, which is called the PSDAR, which for all of you who don't know what that is, it's the decommissioning plan, which includes the cost estimates for decommissioning the plant. The NRC is required to take public comment on the license transfer, but they are not required to hold a public meeting. But they have agreed to come here tonight. The panel invited them to come, as did um, Vermont's congressional delegation. And I wanna thank their representatives of Senator Sanders, Congressman Welch, and Senator Leahy here tonight. We have um, Haley Perro from Senator Sanders' office, Tom Barry from Senator Leahy's office, and George Twig from Congressman Welch, and they can all wave. So we really appreciate, we appreciate their help. Um, and I also want to, again, thank the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for um, accepting our invitation to come here this evening. Just so everybody knows, when we get to the comment period, all of the 
uh, comments are going to be recorded by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and entered into the public record. Um, if you don't want to comment this evening, there is a mechanism that you can do so through the NRC website. And the comment period is going to be through June 23rd. And what we're going to do is put the link on how to do it on the state of Vermont's website. And if no one minds, if you signed up, I will send you how to get that. So if you're shy and you don't want to make a comment tonight, you have another close to a month to do so. Um, the first half of the meeting, we're going to have Entergy and North Star talk to us about the license transfer and the post shutdown decommissioning activities report. And then the NRC is going to walk us through the process that they use to decide whether they're going to accept the license transfer application. One of the things I want to remind everybody is that this is an NDCAP meeting and we're a panel that was created by the state which means we follow all open meeting laws and we um, follow Robert's rules of order and a charter that we all developed two and a half years ago. So what I would ask is that everybody sort of respect how we um, run our meetings. Um, they've gone smoothly in the past, so I'm hoping that they will go smoothly tonight. And I think we're going to start what we normally do at, at our meetings. Joe Lynch, who is the uh, Senior Government Affairs Manager, gives us an update on the decommissioning of the plant. So for those of you who have been here before, um, this will be like the next chapter or whatever in the book. Um, for some of you, this may be the first time that you hear a decommissioning report from Joe. And Everything that um, the presentations that Joe gives are on the Entergy has a website, vydecommissioning.com. So if you're really intrigued and want to watch everything that's happened before or see everything that's happened before, you can easily um, catch up with that. So I guess we'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Kate. Um, as Kate has mentioned, my name is Joe Lynch. I'm a senior government affairs manager for Entergy Vermont Yankee. Uh, I'm going to provide you with a brief update on the status of decommissioning, the uh, decommissioning trust fund, and some of the activities that we have uh, moving towards the transaction. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, one of the key projects right now at the site is the uh, construction of the second of two uh, dry fuel storage pads. Um, the construction on the second pad started back in 2016. There was a break uh, over the winter period uh, due to weather. We restarted construction of the pad on March 13th. Um, we've been moving right along with progress. Uh, just this week we completed the reinforcing bar placement for the second pad. So the pad is now ready uh, to accept um, concrete and that, that pour will be scheduled, um, we believe, next week, weather depending. Um, in addition to that, we've been going through the efforts of uh, getting ready for our 2017 uh, dry fuel storage campaign. Uh, at this point, we're estimating that uh, if we start over the next couple weeks, which is our target, we'll be loading approximately 20 dry casts in 2017. Then again, we'll take uh, a break uh, over the winter for weather reasons and we'll complete the remaining uh, dry casts. There's a total of 45 casts that have yet to be loaded. There are 13 on the pad right now for our total of 58. Um, our target is to have all fuel transferred uh, either in the late third quarter of 2018 or early fourth quarter of 2018. Again, part of that is uh, uh, weather dependent and ensuring that our, we meet our, our schedule. Next slide. Uh, some current pictures uh, in the upper right-hand corner. That is the current configuration of the first pad with the 13 casts. We recently rearranged that configuration to uh, be ready for the acceptance of the uh, new loaded casts, which I had mentioned will start uh, very soon. Um, the picture in the lower left is the pouring of what is known as the leveling slab. So this is essentially the um, a pad that is put in place so we can then place the rebar on top of it. 
Um, that was done recently, and that sets the stage for then constructing the, uh, the second pad. Next slide, please. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, workers um, you know, putting the rebar in place, the reinforcing bar in place on top of that leveling slab. Um, and then you can see in the uh, lower left, um, the rebar being rigged in place. This is very heavy steel that is uh, placed in a, in a very detailed configuration. It is then uh, wired together and in, in advance of us pouring uh, the concrete. Next slide, please. Um, we've been talking about water management for about a year and a half now. Um, as many of you know from previous meetings, we have water entering into the lower elevations of our turbine building. Um, over that period of time, we have made measures to capture that water, uh, store it on site, and then ultimately ship it. Um, we continue to monitor the intrusion water and address it by uh, making repairs to any cracks or crevices where water is coming in. Um, we continue those efforts and they've been very successful in reducing the amount of intrusion water. This time of year uh, and in the springtime is, is typically a time of the year that you see an increase in the groundwater elevation and therefore an increase in that intrusion. Um, because of the efforts, we've been able to maintain and manage that uh, to very low numbers. I don't have today's number, but I think we're looking at about three, uh, 600 gallons a day is, is uh, the number that, that we're seeing. The groundwater is captured, uh, placed into frac tanks, tested, and then shipped to uh, Energy Solutions where they have a licensed disposal site in Tennessee. Right now we're shipping about three per month at the present intrusion rate, and um, we've shipped 517,000 gallons to date. Next slide, please. Next slide. In regards to uh, the two efforts that are necessary to go forward with the transaction, uh, one of course will be discussed um, in a very short matter of time as the uh, NRC has been um, requested to take a look at a lance, uh, license transfer application as, as well as the revised PSDAR. We're also going through the process of seeking approval from the State of Vermont Public Service Board through the Certificate of Public Good process. The first round of discovery requests on us were uh, sent out on uh, March 17th. We provided responses on April 26th. Um, there has been a request by Department of Public Service and others to um, extend, extend that a bit because of um, certain documents that are, are confidential in nature. So we had to um, file a motion to ensure that these uh, confidential documents were treated in a certain way and that those, those uh, entities that intervene would, would uh, respect them that way. There's also um, a couple of documents that are very sensitive to North Star's business that also need special treatment and we're going through the process right now of, of getting that protocol worked out. Um, so the second round of discovery requests on us were supposed to be May 10th, but because of the delay in this handling of documents, um, that will be uh, delayed to be about three weeks after all documents have been um, produced. Um, there's also been some motions by some of the interveners, including New England Coalition, um, asking for partial summary judgment going back to some earlier dockets on some orders that had already been made. Um, those are going through the process in the Public Service Board. Bottom line, very detailed, very comprehensive process of going through um, this approval in the state of Vermont, and um, we're hoping that this will all uh, take place over the next year or so with approval at the end of first quarter of 2018. Next slide, please. Next slide. An update on the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust Fund. Um, at the end of March, last reported, the um, uh, the commissioning trust fund was at $568.9 million. The most current number at the end of April was $570 million. Uh, that increase was due to uh, positive market performance offset by um, the qualified reimbursements that we have made from the trust and some of the fund expenses that we have to pay, essentially taxes. So to date in 2017, we've made uh, just under $12 million in qualified withdrawals. We've earned about $21.7 million in market gains and paid $1.4 million in, in expenses. 
The second trust that we've been maintaining is a site restoration trust. This is uh, wholly funded by Entergy. Uh, we have made four payments of $5 million or $20 million. However, due to growth of the trust fund, that currently stands at $23.6 million at the end of April. And we have one $5 million contribution yet to be made at the end of this year. Next slide, please. Um, and so far as our communications and um, providing information to the public, uh, we continue obviously to participate in this panel. We continue to do speaking engagements, uh, media interviews, local advertising, and we uh, continue to be uh, very strong partners with our community. On occasion, we are able to do uh, tours at the site. Um, they, of course, are gonna be impacted by ongoing site activities, so we need to be mindful to a lot of work that's going on at the site. So um, we uh, ask if we have these type of tours, we get advance notice. And then of course we continue to put information out uh, through our website, vydcommissioning.com. And I'm happy to report that the website has been updated recently and it continues to be updated. This is a screenshot. If you were to go on to vydcommissioning.com, you will see uh, kind of the updated website that now has search capabilities um, and it is being updated constantly with the latest information and we're also going through the process of renaming a lot of these documents to make it easier for uh, individuals to find them and um, kind of migrate their way through. There's been a lot of information put out and we're uh, committed to making sure that we can get that information out efficiently. And unless there's any questions, um, that was kind of the end of what I planned to prepare. Kate. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, just so everybody, I'm not sure how many people have the paper agenda, and we're gonna flash it up on the screen later. Um, the public comment portion of this meeting will start in about an hour. And if you wanna speak and haven't signed up, there are sign-up sheets um, over on the table. We will have a break after the presentations are made, so you don't have to storm the table right now, there will be opportunity um, between when this portion ends and when the public comment period begins. Um, next, I want to invite uh, Scott State, who's the CEO of North Star, and Mike Toomey, who is the um, Vice President for External Affairs of Entergy to, um, I guess you're gonna walk us through the license transfer and possibly the PSDAR, but I'll let, I'll let you tell us what you're gonna talk to about, us about. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hey, this is Mike Toomey on behalf of Entergy. Um, uh, this is a joint presentation between Entergy and North Star. I have a limited role at the front end of the presentation and I'll be turning it over to Scott in just, uh, just a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank the panel uh, and the chairwoman for uh, inviting us to participate in this meeting tonight, provide additional information about this transaction. Um, so with no more uh, introductory remarks. I'll go to the next slide. Um, start briefly with a, uh, what I hope is a complimentary uh, update uh, without duplicating anything that Joe Lynch just covered. Uh, right now we have approximately 150 employees at the site. Uh, that is our, our staffing level that we expect to maintain through approximately the third or fourth quarter of 2018. The next major milestone is the completion of the dry fuel storage project. So when that work that Joe was referring to earlier is completed, when all of the canisters have been moved onto the pad, all the spent fuel moved out of the pool, we will have a staffing reduction uh, at that time. Uh, along the way, we will continue to have our communications uh, with the panel as well as uh, employees and uh, regulatory bodies. Uh, Joe mentioned we've got a certificate of public good pending in front of the Public Service Board. In general, for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, it's an application seeking approval from the Public Service Board for the transaction that we've proposed. Uh, we have a similar but, but separate filing pending in front of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. We also need approval from that federal agency uh, for the transaction. Uh, Joe spent some time talking about the discovery issues. I'll say that right now the procedural schedule contemplates um, one more public hearing opportunity, uh, similar to the one that we had earlier in the year. 
Uh, I don't believe the date of that has been nailed down. I think it's currently September 5th or 6th, uh, depending on, on the availability. That date itself may be adjusted depending on where we are with the discovery process and the, and the testimony process. We will have evidentiary hearings, technical hearings, I believe is the right term, in front of the Public Service Board uh, late in the year. Uh, those hearings are currently scheduled for uh, November, but it is, is possible that the discovery issues and the testimony deadlines will impact the schedule for the technical hearings. So I would say that at this point, th those are not uh, set in stone. Uh, we have requested that the board take action on the application by the end of the first quarter of 2018. We obviously have no power to compel uh, the schedule for the board. We've simply told them that, that that's the schedule we, we would hope uh, they could meet. Um, and we'll just see how the process unfolds. Um, we've got the license transfer application pending at the NRC. And North Star submitted an updated post-shutdown decommissioning activities report on April 6th, and I'm going to let Scott talk about those details, but in general, those of you who've been following this closely, Entergy filed a PSDAR back in uh, November of 2014. This document, this new PSDAR, would be a substitute for the earlier filed Entergy document and would become the operative document for the project if the transaction is approved by both the NRC and the PSB. Um, the, the timeline at, at the bottom there on, on this slide is, is the timeline that was reflected in the post-shutdown decommissioning activities report that Entergy submitted back in 2014. Um, everyone knows we ceased commercial operations in December of 2014. The reactor was permanently defueled in January 2015. Uh, we contemplated fuel transfer by 2020. Uh, so the first update that you've gotten in the last few months is that we now believe we can complete that fuel transfer by the third or fourth quarter of 2018, which is a two-year improvement on the fuel transfer schedule that we had originally anticipated. Um, that means that the safe store dormancy period would commence under our ownership, if we retain ownership, after the fuel is moved to the pad in 2018 and that will be of some indeterminate length. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail tonight because we're really focused on the license transfer application, but um, that safe store period will be uh, however long it needs to be under the requirements of the settlement agreement that we have with the state of Vermont, the funding of the Nuclear Decommissioning Trust Fund, and the uh, decommissioning cost estimate that we have for the project under Entergy's ownership. Um, and so the rest of the dates are, are again, dates that would be in, in effect if Entergy retains the ownership of the site. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll, I'll just introduce, you know, introduce this concept again, which is that one of the primary benefits of the proposed transaction is that it substantially accelerates the safe decommissioning of the plant under ownership of a company and, and with work uh, with a team that it's put together that has the capacity and the experience and the expertise to complete the decommissioning project on a much quicker timeline than under Entergy's ownership. And so with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Scott State. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Kate. Uh, I'm Scott State. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of North Star. Uh, I, just with a show of hands, how many folks are here that haven't been to any of these meetings before where, where we've spoken? Not too many. That, that's good. I, that means there's, uh, I think, good engagement among the community here. Uh, I, I'm not going to go over a lot of things that I've gone over before, but uh, I do want to initially here cover who our team is. Uh, and North Star, if, if you go around the room, you can see we put up some uh, large photographs uh, this evening to show you some of the large-scale projects that, uh, that we've done. And, and I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but it's important just in terms of the scale of work that we do uh, as we consider how we would do this project. And uh, you know, what, what you'll find is that the size of projects that we've done in many, many cases bound the size of Vermont Yankee. And, and I'll, I'll talk through that a little bit more as we get into it. 
Uh, in addition to ourselves on our team, uh, we've got Ariva, and uh, we've talked about Ariva at past meetings. Ariva is a large nuclear services business. Uh, it's a, a French-owned company. The subsidiary that we work with is a U.S.-based firm in Washington, D.C. And they have a, a, a couple of specific things they're going to do for us on this project. One is uh, they're going to segment the reactor vessel and the reactor vessel internals. Uh, and that, that's a significant component of the project in that it's got a high degree of uh, highly radioactive material. Uh, that's one of the first activities that we'll do. Uh, Arriva will also be assisting us over uh, the many years that we will be uh, caretaker for the spent nuclear fuel that, that will remain at the site until the Department of Energy comes and removes it. Uh, a second subcontractor is Burns & McDonald. Uh, Burns & McDonald is a large engineering firm based in Kansas City. And uh, they are specifically going to support us with some engineering activities and some licensing activities uh, as we do this project. And our third supplier is uh, Waste Control Specialist, or WCS, uh, based in Texas. Uh, an important component of this team because they take the radioactive waste or the material that uh, comes from the decommissioning project and it goes to their site in Texas for disposal. Uh, WCS is part of, is the disposal site for the Texas and Vermont Compact. So by statute, the material created at this project uh, will have a right to be disposed at that site and uh, they're our partner on this project as well. Turning to the next slide, uh, I'll let Mike start off. This is a, a transition period between Entergy and, and North Star. Right, so for very briefly, we shut the facility down in 2014 and over the next uh, several years we've been focused on getting the dry fuel storage campaign completed. That is taking the spent nuclear fuel that's currently in the spent nuclear fuel pool and moving it into the canisters that are on the, uh, the dry cast storage uh, cast pads uh, in the yard. And the, the effort to do that, um, when completed, will have removed approximately 95% or more of the radioactive material from the plant and isolated that to the asphyxi pad. The next step after you do that is to focus on the major dismantling work. And as the owner of that facility in 2014, uh, we were hearing loud and clear from the community, from the state, from all stakeholders, that the primary concern was that this site be decommissioned as quickly as possible, while, while safely, but, but not have the site languish for, for 60 years. And so in an effort to be responsive to those concerns, uh, we evaluated the potential for another owner of that facility who was an expert in decommissioning and, and made the determination that this project could be turned over to a new owner who could do it as safely as we could, but more cost effectively and more efficiently than we could. And then that presents the opportunity for this transaction that we're talking about this evening. And with that, I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about what work they would do if the transaction were approved. So if, if, if this transaction does get approved, in 2018 we will take ownership of the site and the first two years of our project work will be focused on segmenting the reactor vessel and the reactor vessel internals. And that will take the removal of radiological material uh, out of the plant to about 99% of what was the original source term, leaving about 1% residual radioactive material that we will be removing with the very vast majority of the volume of material coming out of the site after that. Uh, and this is contamination on concrete uh, and, and that sort of thing that we will be dealing with post the removal of the vessel and the internals. So you can see the title of this chart is actually Vermont Yankee Contaminated Site Cleanup. And it, it's an important distinction that we make when we look at a project like this. Uh, we aren't nuclear power plant operators. Uh, and we don't really view this specifically as a, a, a cleanup of uh, a facility uh, that's a nuclear power plant. We view it as uh, decommissioning of a contaminated site. And all around this room you see pictures of large projects that we've done 
where we've uh, decommissioned some type of contaminated site. And it may have been contaminated with radiological materials or uh, PCBs or mercury or other hazardous components or asbestos. Uh, but, but everything that we do as a company is uh, involves remediating uh, contaminated facilities or sites. And that's exactly how we view Vermont Yankee. So, you know, our project durations here, you can see that once we get the vessel out and the internals, uh, those are segmented, they're packaged, and they're shipped to Texas. Uh, we've got about a six-year program planned at this point in time for the final decommissioning activities, which would take the site to what would be termed a partial site release. And it's called a partial site release because the ISFACI with the uh, spent fuel in the, in the canisters that are, are there, uh, that piece of the site can't be released until that fuel is taken away. So uh, site-wise, you know, all but a very small number of acres can be released in, in roughly 2026. And that would be our target schedule at this point. And then how long we, uh, we have the ISPACI in place uh, is, is really not in our control. Uh, we certainly would like to see DOE come and take that fuel away. Once that piece of the project is done, we will remove the ISPACI pad and all of that uh, remaining material. And the site then will be, uh, will go for a final license termination and a full uh, site release. So as I mentioned, as a company, North Star has decommissioned thousands of facilities of various sizes with various types of contaminants. Uh, there's a number of projects back here that have radiological components, uh, some of them uh, uh, significantly larger in various aspects of the work. Uh, what we've done with these, with these uh, photographs, and, and uh, we'll probably present these again at, at future meetings, and you know, if folks want to talk when we're at the break with any of our people, we've got quite a few of our uh, employees here this evening that can kind of walk you through uh, these various projects. But there's uh, placards on each project that show you the volume of contaminated concrete, metal, and soil that was involved in each one of them. And then there's also a, a line on those that show you what the equivalent or the, uh, the same materials are in Vermont Yankee. And, and it, it'll give you kind of an idea, I think, that we've got a lot of bounding projects uh, on a comparative basis. Uh, we also have a short video, which uh, we'll show in just a few minutes. And it's, uh, a lot of it is time-lapse footage of us removing uh, large structures, commercial, industrial structures, uh, and that type of thing. And you can see over you know, uh, less than 10 minutes, you'll see uh, many years of work that we've done uh, on a time-lapse basis. Uh, so going forward to the next uh, me, three charts, uh, this chart, on each of the, the next three charts, you'll see a, a green box. The green box is the volume of material that uh, we will be removing on an annual basis at Vermont Yankee. Uh, Vermont Yankee is a six-year project with various phases, so on an annual basis we look at how much material we would generate in each of three primary waste classes, concrete, metals, and soil. So in terms of concrete, uh, and I don't know if you can read this in the audience or not, but the, the primary large structures that we deal with that have concrete are going to be commercial. Uh, power plants, you know, nuclear power plants have a significant amount of concrete because it's, uh, you know, it's the way the plants are built and it has shielding uh, capabilities. But for the most part, the very large amounts of concrete waste that are generated in decommissioning projects come from commercial jobs. And as you can see, the, the largest facility here, an industrial facility, which happened to be a smelter, uh, had 200,000 uh, tons of concrete per year. And the reason this is important is in a project like this, uh, these types of projects are logistics jobs. You're, you're moving volumes of material, and your ability to move volumes of material will determine how quickly you can get the work done. So, you know, just on a comparative basis, uh, Vermont Yankee is about 16,000 tons uh, of concrete per year. Our, our largest project that we've done in the last five to seven years is 200,000. Uh, all of these projects, there's approximately 15, I think, here are, are you know, roughly double or more the size of the amount of concrete that we will generate and remove at Vermont Yankee. 
Similarly, the next slide uh, shows metals. Uh, in a uh, project like this, the primary metals in a nuclear plant are going to be rebar. Uh, Joe showed you the uh, construction of the ISFAC, uh, the laying of rebar. If you are familiar with how this plant was built, uh, the, the structures of this plant have a lot of very heavy rebar in them, so we will be uh, breaking the concrete out and uh, separating the metal typically, the, the rebar mesh, and uh, uh, packaging all of this for disposal at the, uh, the WCS site in Texas. So from, from this figure you can see that uh, as far as metals on projects, there are a lot of these projects that are power plants. And a fossil plant, uh, interestingly enough, has a lot more structural steel in it than a nuclear plant. The, the structural materials in a nuclear plant, a, a lot of those are actually concrete. In a fossil plant, they're typically uh, large steel members and, and then a lot of uh, rebar mesh as well. But you know, here you can see we've got a, a number of projects, some two to three times the size of Vermont Yankee on an annual production basis of metals that we would have uh, removed and, and disposed of. And then the last slide, yeah, it deals directly with soils. And uh, when we went through and looked at these kinds of projects, we have to be, we, we do a lot of uh, heavy civil environmental work where we maybe build levees and dams and that sort of thing. We took all of that out because that's really not dealing with contaminated soils. This is all projects that deal with soil that has some type of contamination. And uh, you know, at power plant sites that could be uh, things like coal ash, uh, and, you know, a number of different things, soils that maybe uh, come out of an industrial facility that have mercury or PAHs or PCBs or, or something like that. At Vermont Yankee, we're, we're looking at a site that's likely going to have more radiological contamination in the soil than uh, these other types of components. Uh, and one of the pictures in the back corner is a, a project that we did a couple of years ago at the Hanford site where we removed 250,000 tons of soil, radiologically contaminated soil. And by comparison, we, we think the you know, soil volume as we currently are looking at it is about 28,000 tons at Vermont Yankee. So a, a project roughly 10 times the size of Vermont Yankee in terms of remediating radiologically contaminated soils. Right, so um, I think we've covered this, but the, but the milestones then are, uh, we, are uh, we have requested that the NRC take action on the license transfer amendment by the end of the year. Uh, I'll make the same disclaimer I made with respect to the Public Service Board. We have no ability to control the schedule at the NRC, so we've simply made the request. Uh, and we are hopeful that uh, if we've submitted all the proper material and uh, they've got the information that they need, that a decision could be reached. Um, but that's a hope uh, and a target, not a, not a definitive date. And the Public Service Board I mentioned, uh, March of 2018 was the, was the request. And uh, the spent fuel movement to the Isfisia, I'd say that's a, an element over which we have much greater control. That's, that's operational control on our side. Uh, the dry cask uh, campaign for 2017 should begin next week uh, to move 20 of the remaining 45 casks. That would leave 25 casks to be moved next year. If we stay on schedule, we should be done by, uh, by the fourth quarter. And then if we receive approvals from the NRC and the Public Service Board, and if those approvals do not contain any conditions that are unacceptable to the parties, uh, we would hope to close the transaction at the end of uh, 2018. And uh, with that, I believe there's a short video that the uh, our expert driver over there is going to tee up and uh, get moving. This is a project that we did a couple of years ago, and uh, it's a in basically an entire city block in the middle of Los Angeles. And so you can imagine the logistics trying to get material out, uh, 50,000 tons of concrete. And uh, essentially we, we removed this building one floor at a time, uh, taking the material from the top to the bottom, putting it on transport vehicles and taking it out of the middle of the city of Los Angeles. 
And when we got done, that's a site much like uh, Vermont Yankee will look like. This project uh, we did about four or five years ago. This is Launchpad 39B, which has some historical significance. It's uh, the launch pad that the uh, Challenger launched from, the last launch from that pad. Uh, this video doesn't really give you necessarily a good idea of the scale of this structure. It's, it's incredibly large. And uh, there were a lot of constraints on this. Uh, we couldn't drop material like this to the ground. The, uh, the pad, the launch pad itself, had to be uh, retained and kept in good order because they had a, a mobile launch structure they were going to use on the pad. Uh, this just shows some of the specialty equipment we use that uh, that we will be using here as well. Uh, and then this is a time lapse of the structure over a period of a number of months as we. Uh, picked and peeled away all the pieces and, uh, and took the entire structure apart. This is a, a structure in the middle of Las Vegas. Um, anybody that's been there would probably recognize the facility. This, this was a 27-story building that was constructed, never opened, had structural defects, and had to be removed. Uh, it sits right on Las Vegas Boulevard, so again, a very significant logistics challenge to get that much concrete out uh, on a busy corner. Uh, another successful job about two years ago. This is a, a project at a, uh, an Ivy school. We, we do a lot of work in the Northeast, uh, removing old facilities at the, uh, the Ivy League schools and, and other uh, facilities in the Boston area. And so this is a, uh, a project that we've, uh, I think we're still conducting today, but it's uh, some work I believe we did last year. What you see there is the, the concrete and rebar mesh that's, that's generally mixed together. This is a, a project that's larger than Vermont in uh, every respect. It's a power plant in New York. And uh, it's a project that we are just finishing up uh, some of the soils remediation at this point in time and reseeding. But uh, you can see this is a, a project that was done in, in a city environment and uh, large boilers, so a lot of metal, a lot of concrete, a very old structure, a lot of contamination from uh, the uh, types of fuels used here. And, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, a site that, that went off without a hitch and uh, you know, logistically probably, you know, or size-wise, the property is, you know, similar size to Vermont Yankee as well. Those are stacks that are somewhat similar to uh, the Vermont Yankee stacks. Those uh, came down about three days apiece using specialty equipment that, uh, that we use for stack removal. So 
this is a uh, New York Power Authority plant that we did uh, about a year and a half ago. We finished uh, a very large project. This plant actually has a boiler. Uh, we, we believe it's the largest boiler uh, that, that may have ever been constructed. Uh, massive steel structure to deal with in this, in this facility and uh, a pretty, uh, pretty intense environment in terms of working uh, essentially in the city of New York taking this plant down. We, we do take down a number of structures in the middle of New York City. Uh, we removed the entire St. Vincent's Hospital. We did uh, all the renovation work at Madison Square Garden. We did most of the removal of Yankee Stadium. Uh, none of those projects are depicted here. They're not particularly relevant to Vermont Yankee, but uh, we're accustomed to doing very large projects in, in complicated and difficult places. Some key, you know, key things about this kind of project and, and about Vermont Yankee. You know, we we do uh, a lot of decontamination and removal of environmental contaminants inside these structures. When you peel off the outside of the structure, uh, then you're just removing structural materials and steel in uh, uh, an environment that's been decontaminated. And this is a, another facility in uh, Las Vegas that we did last summer. Uh, a large multi-block uh, structure that uh, uh, we did on a, a very accelerated timeline. We actually did this project in about nine months. Uh, it was a, a fast track site. Uh, one of the things you don't see here is this is a, a site that we actually imploded. And uh, I didn't want to have video of implosions because we're not going to use implosions at Vermont Yankee. I didn't want to give anybody the visual of the massive cloud of dust that rises when you do that type of thing. Uh, we do have a photograph in the back left corner of a cooling tower at the Savannah River nuclear site that we, we also took down by implosion. Uh, it was a clean tower that our government had built for about $100 million and never used. And so we imploded it and removed that a few years ago. But uh, yeah, this is a site, when you can do implosion, uh, it, it's a very fast way to take down structures of this type. And uh, you get the material to the ground, you process the concrete out and the metal out. So uh, of note, uh, you know, we've stated a number of times that we're a very safety conscious and environmental regulatory compliant company and, and every project you saw there was operated in, in that type of manner. That's it. Great, thank you very much. Um, now I want to introduce or have them introduce themselves, the representatives that have come um, here from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They're going to explain the um, process that they go through in order to approve or not approve uh, the license transfer um, that Entergy and North Star are asking for. And again, I want to thank you folks for coming tonight. And I know we'll have um, some questions and comments for you after your presentation. So thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, my name is Andrea Cook. I'm the deputy director of our decommissioning division um, in NRC headquarters from Rockville, Maryland. Um, I also wanted to thank Kate and her colleagues of the panel for inviting us here tonight, as well as the Vermont delegation. We do appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we are pleased to be here. And I, I mean that sincerely because it is important for us to consider your comments um, with regard to our regulatory processes. It's important that we touch base with you and consider those comments as part of our process. So we do act very much appreciate the invitation this evening. Um, as Kate mentioned, the main purpose of us being here tonight is to gather your comments. Um, with regard to our review of the uh, application we have before us for transfer of the Vermont Yankee license to North Star. Um, and Kate also mentioned that we recently, just this week, issued a federal notice asking for comments on the application. So this is your opportunity to get your comments in early. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we're transcribing uh, your comments during the meeting tonight. So if you have a comment and you've made the comment at the meeting, there isn't a need for you to submit an additional comment on the docket to the NRC. 
What we're going to do tonight is provide you an overview, as Kate mentioned, of what we look at when we look at a transfer application, our process, and the criteria that we use. Um, and I wanted to assure you that that review will be independent and thorough. Um, as one of the cornerstones of the way the NRC operates as an independent regulator. It's very important to us as an organization, and it's important to me as an individual that that's the way we operate. Um, and part of us being independent and thorough is getting out in the community to hear from you, but also uh, getting out to the sites that we regulate. And in that vein, we did visit the Vermont Yankee site today to get a sense of what's going on there from a decommissioning perspective. And I think that helps us to put our own eyes on the site and gather our own thoughts so that we make sure we are being independent as well as having a good understanding of what's going on on the ground. Um, I'll just take a minute here to introduce the NRC staff that are going to present this evening. Um, first, we're going to hear from Bruce Watson. He's our chief of the reactor decommissioning branch. Um, he has extensive experience in decommissioning, and he's going to go over for you just an overview of the decommissioning process and our process for review of the transfer application. And then we're going to hear from Jack Parrott here to my left. He's our project manager for the Vermont Yankee site. He's going to go into a little bit more detail for you about uh, the process we follow and some of the considerations that we look at um, in the transfer application. And then lastly, we'll hear from Mike Dusanuski. Um, he's an economist who works for the NRC. He looks at all of the decommissioning funding reviews that we do to make sure that plants have adequate uh, decommissioning funding to decommission. Um, I just also wanted to mention that we have Ray Powell here. He's from our Philadelphia office in, in the region. He's sitting here in the front row. If you have questions about our oversight process, an important thing that Bruce will touch on is that the NRC's oversight doesn't stop when a plant goes into decommissioning. Um, we do extensive uh, inspections uh, periodically, um, and Ray's group leads those inspections from our regional office in Philadelphia. I just one final note, and then I'll turn it over to Bruce. Um, I did want to echo something that Kate said. Our review is currently ongoing of the application, so we haven't made any conclusions about whether uh, North Star is financially or technically uh, uh, qualified to hold the license. We're um, still in the initial stages of our review, so we won't be able to give you any bottom line conclusions about what we think about this or that. And I don't want you to take that as us being standoffish or or hiding something. We're just we're not at that point in the process. We can tell you what we look at, um, the criteria that we go by, but we haven't drawn any conclusions one way or the other at this point in the review. Um, we can let you know where we are in the process. We're happy to answer questions. Um, we would really appreciate your comments. Um, and because we haven't made any conclusions, a lot, uh, some of our responses may just be thank you for your comment because we don't at this point have a conclusion. And I wanted to make that clear. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Bruce Watson, and again, thank you for inviting us. Well, thank you again for having us come out tonight and for the invitation. Um, I want to give a real quick brief overview of, of a few of the items before we get into some of the more detail from the staff. Uh, on slide one, I just want to remind everybody that the NRC role in decommissioning is to ensure that the, si the facility or site is removed from service and that the radiological conditions will meet the license cri criteria for license termination. Uh, and we have two conditions in which that license can be uh, terminated under unrestricted use or restricted use. To date, all decommissioning sites in the United States, including the 10 power reactors that have been completed decommissioning and had their licenses terminated, have been released for unrestricted use, meaning the owner can use the property for whatever purpose they have intended to do in the future. And for this particular site, I believe both uh, Entergy and North Star will be, have the criteria that they're going to release the site, uh, terminate the license for unrestricted release. Also, I want to point out that once the license is terminated or in parallel with the license termination process, the actual restoration of the site is up to the owner and the state and its stakeholders. So once the radioactive materials are removed, uh, they're free to do whatever they choose to do for the site. If we can go to the next slide, please. The, uh, in April 2017, a revised PSDAR, post-shutdown activities, uh, post-shutdown decommissioning activities report was submitted to the NRC uh, by North Star. It is contingent on the sale and license transfer. Uh, one of the key features of this PSDAR is that North Star plans to complete the decommissioning by as early as 2016. 
Uh, we will review the PS. Oh, excuse me, 2026. Excuse me. And uh, um, we will review the uh, PSDR with the same rigor that we reviewed the uh, the Entergy PSDR that was submitted in 2014. And uh, two of the one of the guidance documents that you may be familiar with is Reg Guide 1.185. It's available on our public website. And of course, we've uh, issued the Federal Register notice, and we will accept, be accepting uh, comments on both the license transfer and the PSDR. Um, and this will end on June 23rd, 2017. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jack Parrott to talk about the license transfer process. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? So, uh, reactor decommissioning license transfers, uh, they're a relatively common occurrence. The license for Vermont Yankee uh, was previously transferred to Energy in 2002. NRC has regulations in place to ensure that reactor licenses are transferred to, to a technically and financially viable company. Transfers of licenses to facilitate the decommissioning of reactors have occurred twice before for the Zion and La Crosse plants. Next slide, please. Our review process, um, it, the application for license transfer was submitted in February, on February 9th, 2017. The license transfer documents are available on our public website on the, uh, the URL on, on the slide there. Um, acceptance review was documented. Uh, our acceptance review of the, of the license application was uh, documented by a letter dated April 6th, 2017. The, our acceptance review looked to see that the technical and financial re review topics are covered, uh, but nevertheless, there still could be a request for additional information from our uh, subsequent review. The notice of consideration was published in the Federal Register yesterday, uh, and it includes an opportunity for hearing and an opportunity for public comment. The opportunity for hearing and intervention is open to any person whose interest may be affected by NRC action on this application. The opportunity remains open 20 days after the notice of consideration that was published yesterday. Uh, the the uh, opportunity for public comment is a 30-day period where written comments can be submitted for consideration by the staff during the review, our review process. As Andrea mentioned, our technical and financial review is underway. If found acceptable, a safety evaluation report, an order, and a license amendment will be issued by the NRC. Next, next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the two things that we review, uh, primary areas, are the technical qualifications and the financial qualifications. The technical qualification review areas um, focus on the management, the technical support, and on-site organization to ensure that they are involved in, informed of, and dedicated to the safe operation of the plant and to determine if sufficient qualified uh, technical resources will be provided for safe operations. All requirements, uh, this is an important point, uh, all of the requirements uh, of the current plant operator and owner at the time of transfer, should, should the transfer be approved, uh, will, be, will transfer to the, the, new, the new company, North Star. Uh, implementation of those requirements is the key and will be under the continued oversight of NRC. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Duzanuski to talk about the financial qualification review. Good evening. The financial qualification review in this particular license transfer is going to be focusing on decommissioning funding assurance, foreign ownership control or domination, and for the Price-Anderson indemnity and nuclear insurance. In this regard, Staff will seek reasonable assurance that the licensee maintains adequate funding to complete decommissioning to NRC standards and terminate the license. And adequate financial protection remains available on-site and off-site commensurate with the risk of the decommissioning plant. Next slide. The NRC maintains a comprehensive regulatory, regulation-based framework to provide assurance that the new licensee for a license transfer maintains the financial means to safely decommission the facility and terminate the license. This framework includes consideration for spent fuel management and ISFC decommissioning. The ISFC stands for Independent State, I'm sorry, I've forgotten there. In, 
Independent spent fuel uh, storage, storage installation. Yeah. installation. Thank you. Uh, also known as the dry cast storage pad yes. for us yes. civilians. Yes. Throughout operations, licensees are required to certify that adequate funding for decommissioning will be available when needed. For a plant that has transitioned to decommissioning, the same requirements apply and licensees provide evidence of adequate, adequate funding through annual reports submitted to the NRC. These reports separately provide transparency in the, license, in the license's use of decommissioning trust funds, the estimated cost for, to complete decommissioning and management of spent fuel, available funding to cover these costs, and any material changes to the trust agreements or other allowable funding mechanisms. For a license transfer, these responsibilities are incumbent on the new licensee. Next slide, please. And as a, as a summary of this, the NRC regulations require licensees to maintain adequate financial assurance for decommissioning at all times. Oversight of financial assurance continues until the license is terminated. Licensees submit a financial assurance status report annually. The report includes amounts spent on decommissioning, remaining for trust fund balance, and estimated cost to complete decommissioning. The report is reviewed for reasonable assurance of the adequacy of decommissioning funding. And with that, I will hand it over now to Bruce. Thank you, Mike. I thought I'd conclude our, our, our presentation with a brief discussion on our inspection program. And I want to be clear that our inspection program continues to ensure the safe decommissioning of the site until the license is terminated. Um, we have a dedicated inspection manual chapter for power reactor decommissioning. It's available on our website. It's IMC or inspection manual chapter 2561. It contains core inspection procedures that have to be done every year and a variety of discretionary insp uh, inspection procedures which are done commensurate with the work that is being performed. Our inspection frequency and the amount of time we spend in the inspection process will be commensurate with the amount of activities on site. So we will be coordinating uh, closely with the licensee uh, performing the decommissioning activities. So they'll see us a lot when there's a lot of activities going on and they won't, won't see us as often if there's no activities or very little activities going on. Uh, we are required to conduct the inspection, uh, core inspection procedures annually and these inspection, our inspection reports are publicly available unless they can turn, contain information that's specific to security or safeguards. So with that, I'd like to close our discussion. Uh, I want to thank you for your for listening, and we look forward to your comments. Great. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do now is take a very short period of time to have the panel ask questions and comments. And I'm going to tell everybody right now, um, not everyone is going to get to ask a question or make a comment. And what I would ask is because our time is so limited that we keep them um, to you know one or two minutes because we want to have a, uh, enough time for anyone and everyone in the public who wants to make a comment or ask a question to do so. And I'm going to, because I have the mic, I'm going to ask the first question, which I know is one that has um, come up with the public and members of the panel. And it's a question, I think, for the NRC, North Star, and Entergy, if you all would like to answer it. Um, as the NRC just outlined, one of the um, main points that you're going to look at is the financial assurance that North Star gives you that they, that they can complete the decommissioning within the amount of money they say they are. And one of the big questions that has come up is if the decommissioning is not completed and the money in the nuclear decommissioning trust fund runs out, who is responsible um, for paying for the, the shortfall? And one of the issues I think that comes up around this is since um, Vermont Yankee is a merchant plant, which means it's not getting any money from ratepayers. There's no ratepayers to go back to to get the money. So I guess our question really is who, and we, we know we've heard that they won't run out of money, but there's concern here that there will, there could be a shortfall of funds. So we'd like to know who picks, who's, who's on the hook for the money. 
keep forgetting to turn that on. I can start out and then uh, turn it over to some of our experts, and then I think, Kate, as you pointed out, I think North Star would have a piece of this too. Um, so Scott will probably want to jump in there. But as far as the NRC is concerned, Kate, um, Andrea, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I, everyone has to speak up a little because of the it's, rain it's is raining. in the way. Okay, <laughs> I'll speak up. Um, as I said, I can I can start out and then turn it over to some of our experts, and I think part of this um, can be answered by North North Star as well. Um, from the NRC's perspective, the responsibility for funding is with the license aides. Very clear and very straightforward. So for all regulatory activities, we look to the licensee. They are responsible. So if the license is transferred to North Star, they're responsible for the funding. And if there's a shortage, they're responsible for making up that shortage. Now, our regulations require that they have uh, decommissioning financial assurance at all times. Um, as Mike laid out, we look at the transfer application from the beginning to make sure there's adequate funds. But going forward, our regulations simply state that you have to have adequate funding at all times. And if there is a gap or a shortage, they're required to make that up. And the responsibility for that would be North Star. Um, as far as how they would make that up, I think that's the piece that North Star could help you understand what provisions or where they would look or what their contingency plan is for that. We simply set the regulation to say they have to make that funding up. Um, I'll just add a few more points and then and turn it over to others to add on. Um, as far as you know, what assurances do we have um, for decommissioning um, financial assurance? Um, and I think we've touched on a lot of these already. As Mike mentioned, we have ongoing oversight through decommissioning. So annually, we look at how much is left in the fund, what's their estimate for how much it's going to cost to complete the decommissioning, and then we look to see if there's any gap. So it's not as if we look at it once when the application, when the transfer occurs, and then not again. Um, we also um, do a thorough review at the beginning, as we mentioned, and then we do our annual reviews. Um, the only other thing that I would add is, I think Bruce mentioned this as well, we have had 10 power reactors go into decommissioning and have their licenses terminated. Um, in all cases, that's been done safely um, and funding has been made available. Either the fund was adequate from the beginning or if there were shortages during the decommissioning period, um, those funding shortages were made up. And again, how, how the, those can be made up, there's a variety of ways. Um, I'll turn it over to the North Star to answer how they would look at that. Um, but there, people could have contingency funds, they could have parent company guarantees. Um, there's a variety of ways in which those funds can be made up. We don't dictate how it'd be done, just that it would be done. Do have anything to add? I guess I'll just add a few comments about how North Star looks at this. So the, uh, you know, the, the front line of defense for us is we know how much money is in the trust fund today. We can see it, we can call the bank and they can tell us. And at inception of this project, the way we've established our, our work and the way we pay ourselves, uh, we, we are limited to the amount of money we take out of the trust account by performance of the work. So uh, in our breakdown of this project, we've got a little over 900 work elements. And if we execute all 900 of those work elements, the site will be clean and it will be released for unrestricted use. So when we broke it down into those work elements, we assigned a, a cost to each of them. We added all that cost up, and that cost had to be less than or equal to the amount of money we had to work with to do the decommissioning. So our first line of defense is we simply don't take money out of the trust fund unless we've actually executed the work that that money is tied to. And with that you know, assurance that we don't ever, it's a performance-based assurance that we don't ever take uh, more money than work actually performed. Uh, if you you know if you track it all the way through, and we take out exactly the amount we say we will for each of the work elements, and the work element gets done, then we'll complete this project within the amount of funding that we have. Uh, and the certainty of us executing each of these work elements for that cost is that we will provide a form of surety or guarantee for performance of each of those work elements as we do them. So, you know, that's what we view as the most important way to do a project like this, and it's frankly the way we do every project the company conducts nationwide every day. Uh, we work as a fixed price contractor doing work like this all the time, and we work to budgets on individual work elements. Now, in the event that, that somehow there's a bust and that doesn't work out, 
Uh, we've also committed $125 million performance uh, assurance above and beyond the amount of money that's in the trust fund. And that'll be a, a guarantee by the company. Uh, as we conduct this work, we actually will be taking uh, a percentage of all the funds that we remove from the trust account and putting them into an escrow. And that's a, a cash first line of defense to support the, uh, the, uh, any needed cash obligations that might be above and beyond uh, the nuclear decommissioning trust. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of a two-step process. It's a process of limiting cost and then a process of, of making additional financial capability available above and beyond the funds that we know are, are present today. Thank you. Um, Bill. Yes, thank you. And um, this is likewise likely to be answered by the panel, NRC, Energy, and North Star. And, uh, really dovetails to uh, Kate's question and also to my sincere uh, pleasure to hear that the site could be available to this community for uh, other uses much sooner than originally planned and I, I hope that that does come to pass. Um, and uh, an obstacle to that in my mind is represented at the Connecticut Yankee facility, Yankee Row facility, and uh, the main Yankee facility, where there are many more acres of land, and yet the ISFACI remains, and no development has occurred on any of those three plots of land. So my question is, does the NRC have any practical limitations with a site of about 120 to 130 acres, some of which is going to be taken up by the um, electric infrastructure of the switch yard and also by the ISFACI of having another, some other development on the remaining plot of land that was released for unrestricted use. And two, does North Star um, feel confident that unlike the other owners of plants around New England, they will be able to find a means by which that land can be put back to productive use. Uh, yeah, this is Bruce Watson. I, I, I think um, that the plants that have been decommissioned have, like I said, they all have been decommissioned for unrestricted use. So it's really up to the owner what they want to do. Uh, about a third of them have had additional generation facilities placed on them built on them and, and back into generating power because they do have the grid infrastructure there, they do have a source of cooling water, and they previously had an environmental impact statement for an operating nuclear power plant. So about one-third add generating capacity to the site. Uh, one-third have chosen not to do anything with the site, which would include Connecticut Yankee and a few others. Um, at Maine Yankee, they've chosen in, uh, to uh, make part of the land a park. I think they donated it, part of the land to a nonprofit organization, I think dedicated to uh, naturalization of the, of the land. So it's a, it's a mixed bag on what happens with the property once the license is terminated. Uh, granted, the uh, dry storage facility is there. It is still under a license. Uh, we have uh, strict requirements for that security of that facility. So yes, some of the land is taking up for that per particular purpose. But from the, in the NRC's view, is that the remaining lands that are not required to be under the license are available for any, any, any development or unrestricted use that the, the owner would have for that. So I, I hope I answered that part of the question. Yes. Wait, he's, wait one second, because we're going to let somebody. Are we counting our chickens here before well, the well, wait one second. We gotta, we gotta get the full answer here. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, I, you know, the, the owners of the three facilities you mentioned, uh, I, I've been, to, I haven't been to Connecticut Yankee site. I've been to Yankee Row. I've been to Maine Yankee. You know, those are somewhat remote locations, somewhat remote sites, uh, and you know, the ownership structure there is you still have utility owners or cooperatives in, in essence, uh, multiple parties that own those sites. And I think as a result, you know, there are people that operate or, or there are cooperatives that were formed to operate these plants. I'm not sure that any one of those individual utilities has any specific desire to do anything with those sites. 
we're commercially a very different setup. You know, we are not interested in being the long-term owner and developer of the site after it's clean. What we're interested in doing is working with the local community to find the highest and best use of the property. Uh, we've heard suggestions of, you know, potentially looking at a microgrid. That could be a great idea. Uh, we've suggested a solar facility might be uh, an option there. Uh, but we're not wedded to any specific future use, but we are wedded to finding a future use. And, uh, and we will be, I, I would say, very easy to work with in terms of positioning the property for uh, its, its best potential. Great, thank you. Does anyone on this side? Would... I, I, I'm surprised we would be using this time to discuss what to do with a site that may or may not be cleaned up and that is premature. Um, I've been doing this job long enough to have been to this point several times with the NRC and on the original sale of Vermont Yankee to Entergy, we were given assurances by the NRC that the decommissioning fund was adequate, that the new operation would provide benefits to the state of Vermont. There would be additional revenues to put into the cleanup. And what happened was that Vermont, the owners, shipped all the profits out of state and left the decommissioning fund inadequate enough so that tonight we are here discussing how to clean the place up. The second time we arrived at this point was when the owners of the plant came in and asked to do an upgrade. And your advisory panel that preceded this one recommended in a vote not to do the upgrade because the decommissioning fund was inadequate. Because the NRC assured us that there would be a depository for nuclear waste available if we did an upgrade. And your nuclear advisory panel said that that would not happen and the NRC gave us assurances that there would be a place to send the waste and despite the recommendation that the assurances were not worth the insurances failed to materialize no additional funds were required from the owners to be put into decommissioning to cover the additional waste that was the second time we were here. The third time, Madam Chair, we arrived at this position was when the owners asked for a license extension. And the owners had made a commitment to the state of Vermont, to the legislature, a handshake and a widely understood agreement that the owners would not ask to extend the license without the permission of this, this state and the legislature. And when the owners didn't get permission, the owners went to court to undo the bargain that they had offered. And each time, the owners had slideshows like the one we had tonight, had pictures in the back of the room, and touted their expertise, their professionalism, their ability to deliver on promises. And the chair has asked what happens if a company like North Star, a relatively new company with no deep pockets, is sold the plant and fails to complete the cleanup, who is left holding the bag? And Madam Chair, the reason I asked that question was when an upbreak was being discussed and your VSNAP panel said, don't do the upbreak unless the NRC can tell us what will happen and who will pay and who will be left holding the bag if there's no national nuclear depository. And the, those that make these decisions were persuaded to accept the assurance of the NRC and to trust the owners that things would turn out, out all right. And we are here today because of the, this is about the fourth time that I've served where we given a, a slideshow, promises, guarantees um, that these people are more clever, better accountants, 
They're more responsible than their predecessors. And they're asking us to sign off on a recommendation that if this doesn't work, the answer is the NRC doesn't have a rule for who will be responsible. The rule is the people who will be responsible are the people that have no money. Madam Chair, I, I say that because when, when in the past the NRC told us that there would be a nuclear depository available for the waste by a certain year, and we said, we don't believe you. And they said, that's our rule. There must be. You're not going to get left holding the bag. And when it became clear that there was no nuclear depository available, they, the NRC, changed its rule. I don't want to cut you off, yeah. but. You, you, you would like to, to talk about what we're going to do with this plant after yeah. it's been cleaned up, yeah. instead of what is the guarantee that we're going to be it's just going to be cleaned up, and that the NRC, who writes the rules we have to obey, writes a rule for this, other than that the people that have no money are responsible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't know if there's, you, you answered the question when I asked about who's on the hook. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I didn't want to add anything. I just wanted to clarify um, one thing unrelated to the funding issue, which is that the NRC does, does not set the policy for uh, when and where there will be a national repository. We're responsible for reviewing any application we might get for a repository, making sure that it's safe and issuing a license if we think it's appropriate, but we do not set the national policy on whether there will be a repository, where it will be, or when it will be. Um, that is not something that's within our control or authority. So I just wanted to make that one clarification, but nothing else to add. Thank you. That's true, Thank you. That's true, Madam Chair, but they assured us why well, they don't set the policy that someone else did, they assured us that there would be a depository there. They gave us their assurance. They don't make the policy, but they gave us the assurance, and when it failed, they made up a new set of rules to allow 100 years for, the, for getting rid of the waste. Thank you. Um, Chris. Uh, Chris Campany, Wyndham Regional Commission. Um, the town of Vernon uh, asked the Wyndham Regional Group, uh, had a municipal planning grant to have the Wyndham Regional Commission prepare a resilience plan for what would happen when the plant would eventually close. This was back in 2012. And I just want to see if you can add any clarity uh, uh, as far as when the site might be released with the presence of the ISFACY there. Um, on June 12, 2012, I had a phone conversation with Ronald Bellamy, Chief Reactor Projects Branch of NRC, uh, region one and he said that as long as the uh, uh, ISFACY was there um, after decommissioning that would be unlikely the site would be able to be released for reuse um, so that was from I, I think I think he's retired now and he can't be here to explain his logic but uh, I just wondered what you might want to add or or what your position would might be now um, I, I can't comment on what the conversation was uh, with Mr. Bellamy back then, but uh, any land that is uh, taken off the license, with the exception of the licensed property, which is the dry storage facility, uh, it will be, I, I should say, uh, is planned to be uh, released for unrestricted use, which means it can be used for anything. Uh, that the owner or the town or whatever choose to do, whoever controls the property rights to that piece of land. Uh, yes, the uh, ISFC will be there until the Department of Energy removes the fuel. At that time, when the fuel's removed, the, uh, the actual facility will be uh, decommissioned, and then the entire piece of property will be available for, uh, I would believe at that point, uh, unrestricted use and for, for development for whatever purpose the owners have had. So, uh, you know, I, I can't comment on the basis of the, the conversation you had with him, but uh, like I said, uh, at other facilities, uh, the, the remaining pieces of land have been, have been added uh, generating plants and, and used for other purposes, and some have chose not to use the property at all for uh, just letting it sit for right now. So, 
so just as a okay, can I answer just a follow up? So so I guess what I'm wondering so what's the like the security perimeter likely to be around the SSC? I mean how much of the site would likely be available. I'm asking because like one of the reasons when we went to Connecticut Yankee, one of the reasons why they moved the spent fuel so far away from the site was to facilitate redevelopment of that site. And they did that at a considerable expense to move that away. I thought that was, and I thought at uh, Maine Yankee, that was part of the reason too for removing the spent fuel pretty far away so they could release. And of course, those are much larger sites mm -hmm. than VY. So what would you anticipate like this? The perimeter might be around the ISFACY. Uh, I really can't really answer that because I um, don't normally really look into ISFACYs too much, but I'm sure that uh, there's a certain amount of land uh, that's required for the security plan around it to be uh, under the owner control to make sure that uh, the people who are providing the security and, and um, for the facility have uh, adequate time to respond to any threats. Um, I can tell you that the facility at, at Connecticut Yankee, the dry storage facility, was purposely moved up on the hill uh, because the, the original location had it down in a valley and they thought that was a, a, a not a wise decision for the actual security of the facility and that uh, it, the better place would be up on the hill so that it was on high land uh, for, for security reasons. So I, I hope that answers your question to the best I can, can do today. Okay, we're going to have um, one more panel question, and we'll let Jim Mattel. Thank you. Um, it's actually uh, two questions, but they're both very quick, and I'll throw them both out there together. Um, the first one for North Star, not, not knowing the details um, of the commitment, I understand the, the price per component, everything, and that's, that's encouraging. I, I'm really optimistic about that. But is there anywhere in there, if you encounter something significant that you could make a clear case was reasonably not foreseeable, is there any way for you to go back and seek an increased allotment for that component, which it seems to me would in turn um, jeopardize, could jeopardize the balance of the, of the trust fund? And the second question uh, for the NRC is, if something like that were to happen, or for whatever reason, it got to the point that there wasn't enough money to complete the decon, would it be possible for the owner to apply to go back, in, <clears throat> excuse me, to go back into safe store? I, I hope that's a one word answer. <laughs> so the, the, the first issue you raise is if, if, I think you're saying if we find an unknown source of contamination or something, something. If, if we simply execute poorly, we have no recourse to anyone for anything. If in fact during a, a, a certain specified period of time we find contamination that was undisclosed uh, as part of the transaction, we've got a, a level of indemnification from the seller. That doesn't go on forever, that goes on for a, a certain period of time. So. Uh, you know, it, it behooves us early on in this process to make sure we've got the best characterization we can and determine if there's any unknown contamination uh, that, that was not disclosed to us. Uh, if, in fact, we go through the process and we find unknown contamination after a certain date, it's our obligation to remove that. And uh, we have to remove that to, you know, achieve what the objective here, which is unrestricted use of the site. So, uh, you know, we've done a lot of facilities like this, and we've got a pretty good idea if there should be or would be certain types of contamination. These are not hard things to find. We know what the site was used for. We know generally, you know, what kinds of things were at the site. I can tell you that uh, large sites that had large motor pools a lot of times are really bad sites because, you know, back in the day you just threw everything out the back door, and now it's all over in the groundwater. We know there's been certain events at the site. Uh, we think those are pretty well documented, and we will certainly do uh, a high level of investigation uh, upon ownership to confirm all of that, all of the facts that, that we've got. But you know, generally, we feel like there aren't any of those really big gotchas out there. Uh, but if there are, uh, we do have a certain uh, ability to protect ourselves. Uh, you know, day one uh, for, for those types of things. So, you know, the future. 
Um, hey Gary, we're trying to do our meeting, so let the NRC. Will there be public comment in a minute? Yes, I'm going to hold on to my question. What I hear is yes. stupid. Yes, please do. Okay, please go on, um, Bruce. Obviously, the uh, NRC's view of, of the decommissioning is that the decommissioning has to be completed in 60 years. Uh, so, given the fact that um, this is the business model that North Star is taking, uh, they're using to, to to actually take the sale of the property, uh, it's it's their risk they're taking in, in doing their their review of the site to ensure that they can meet the commitments that they're telling us in the in the documents in the in the financial information. So uh, from any like previous license transfers, we, we would have expected them to do a, their due diligence to protect themselves, uh, review the site history, look at the characterization to ensure that they they have a, a good assurance that they can clean up the site uh, within the funds. Um, Back in 2012, we strengthened our uh, decommissioning regulations. Uh, we actually call it the decommissioning planning rule, and it required that the sites do additional uh, groundwater monitoring close to sites which could produce contamination into the environment so it would be discovered early. Um, I think that's in, enhanced the ability to prevent uh, a lot of underground soil contamination which has been found at a few of the sites that were previously decommissioned. So it, this, these regulations enable the owner or the operator at the time, the licensee, to find contamination and make a determination whether they need to clean it up now or later. Um, so in, the answer is yes, they could go into a safe source situation uh, do for, for whatever reason they choose to. Um, but as I think uh, uh, that's their choice. But in this particular case, they're telling us they're, they're planning to clean the site up uh, from a relational standpoint by 2026. Okay, we have one quick follow-up, then we have to move on. Uh, Mr. State, I just want to follow up quickly on the point about that you're going to do your due diligence uh, post-transfer. We've talked about phase one complete before transfer of the environment, non-radiological environmental review. As the state agency responsible for the non-radiological piece, it, it seems to me that the the agenda that I have about the risk associated with the transfer is related to why wouldn't we want to do that diligence up front and know that information from the phase two prior to transfer. So you know what the gotchas are and we have com more comfort into the financial resources. Um, I, I'd like to add one more piece to, to, to my uh, previous comment in that uh, the NRC regulations require that any incident or uh, I'll call it an event that uh, would result in uh, information that would be important, in, in particular radiological uh, information that would be important to the decommissioning of the future of the site being recorded. And so we do have a requirement that if they had a spill or a, or a contamination that that be well documented in the, in the record for the site history. And so that's one area that, that could be looked at from a, a radiological standpoint. At, um, <clears throat> at, at one level, uh, there have been numerous evaluations of the conditions on that site. Um, certainly the prior owners before Entergy had an obligation to maintain their compliance with their, all the NRC. Can you speak up, sir? You're pretty far away. <laughs> had your all of the requirements that they had to comply with for the NRC. When, we, when Entergy bought the facility in 2002, we did a comprehensive due diligence prior to that sale. Sure, and hey, Gary, also did, Gary. Uh, we also did a uh, site please? assessment study um, there in 2014. Is everybody... there a reason you're interrupting? Yeah, please don't interrupt. I can't hear you. There's nothing to interrupt. Um, I know. I know. Uh, we're going we to let him finish the question so we can move on. We did a comprehensive site assessment study in 2014, and then uh, North Star has been doing their own due diligence uh, as we've been working on this transaction. And I'll let Scott speak to the level of due diligence they've done. It, it, I don't want you to misinterpret what I said before. It, it's not as if we haven't done any due diligence or, or uh, done any level of evaluation. Uh, I was speaking merely to uh, you know, post-closing and opening of structures and you know, doing a very invasive testing. 
that you wouldn't do prior to the closing of a transaction to you know get absolute confirmation of, of what we believe to be true today but you know we we, we are relying on past practice past practices and past evaluations and data that's been generated from prior uh, work on the site and you know we will continue to do that kind of work we've continued to do due diligence we are initiating uh, certain work activities the second half of this year and all next year uh, running up to the, the closing of the transaction so we're not just sitting idly hoping there's nothing there uh, we are doing uh, you know a substantial amount of work to verify uh, the condition of the site at closing thank you um, I think what we're going to do right now is take a five minute break so at 745 we're going to um, take public comment and questions and if you want to make a comment or ask a question there are sign up sheets um, right over there so and we'll take five minutes now what we're going to do is um, take comments or questions from the public and I just want to remind everybody that the NRC is here because it's the official public comment period on the license transfer application that Entergy and Northstar has filed and that of course is about the sale what I'm going to ask is when you come up, if you could state your name and what town or state and or state you are from. Um, it is being recorded by the NRC and as Andrea said earlier, you don't, um, if you speak tonight, you do not have to send written comments to the NRC. But if you choose not to speak tonight, um, there is a mechanism that you can go online on the NRC website and either email a comment in or you can do a written comment and those comments are due by June 23rd. Um, I also want to remind um, everyone that while you may pose a question to the NRC, again I think Andrea stressed this, is that they are still in the process of reviewing the license transfer application so they may not have a, an answer for you because they haven't finished um, the review. I would also ask it if people can keep their comments down to two or three minutes. Um, we'd appreciate it so we can um, move the meeting along. And again, I want to remind everyone that this is a meeting of the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisory Panel. And um, we run by Robert's Rules of Order and our charter. And I just ask everyone to respect that you are at a panel meeting and respect um, all your fellow um, commenters or people that are here this evening. And I'm gonna call people's names in no particular order, so I don't want anyone to think you're, I'm playing favorites in any way. Um, and what I'll do is I'll um, maybe call two, two names at a time so the next person knows that it's their, their shot. Um, the first up is gonna be Skylar Gould. <coughs> And then second is Brad Furland. And again, if you can say your name and your town and state, so we have it in the record. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and you may have to talk louder than usual because of the yeah. rain I'm on the Skyler Gould. I'm uh, oh, Brattleboro. Yeah. I'm Skyler Gould. I live in Brattleboro these days. Um, thanks very much for allowing us to come here tonight. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, has the NRC approved the new Holtec dry cask design which would allow the earlier uh, uh, unloading of fuel uh, beyond uh, uh, shorter than the usual five year uh, cooling off period? I think what I want to do I think what I want to do is have you ask all the questions so okay. you, you can ask all your questions and then they can answer I'll, I'll at ask the same that. time. And another is, um, is, is there some reason the comment period uh, has been reduced from the normal 60 days to 30 days? Um, 20 or 30 days, I'm not sure. I, I think I heard 30 this evening. Uh, a more difficult question. Um, on March 29th, uh, just this year, a judge in the Court of Chancery of the State of Delaware, um, I have the opinion, uh, found that one of the two members of the North Star Group Holdings of which Scott State is the current CEO, current corporate members, uh, I'm quoting here, has adequately alleged facts that, if true, 
demonstrate fraudulent rep representation, unquote. Uh, this is a charge by the other member of North Star Group Holdings. So basically there are two members of North Star Group Holdings. One is accusing the other of fraud. Um, excuse me. Uh, Nor North Star Decommissioning Holdings, the, the Limited Liability Corporation incorporated last November which is seeking to purchase Vermont Yankee from Energy, is owned by North Star Group Services, which is owned by LVI Parent Corporation, which is owned by North Star Group Holdings, which is at the heart of this fraud case. Uh, they're seeking over $213 million in damages. Um, essentially, Scott State and his, uh, his member of the North Star uh, Group Holdings uh, are accused of misrepresenting their corporate members' assets and liabilities to the tune of $213 million. So my question to the NRC is, do the facts of this case... Did you know this? Did you know this? Again, Gary, please, Gary, give me a break. Uh, do the facts of this case concern the commission, and, and will the commission fully consider this above-mentioned suit and what it may say about the integrity of the terms of the proposed sale? And secondly, is the commission confident that should the plaintiff in the above case prevail, which the judge in the case has concluded is enough of a possibility to allow the case to go forward, will the structural integrity of the North Star Enterprise, the larger North Star <laughs> Enterprise, allow the decommissioning of, of uh, Vermont Yankee to be completed according to regulatory requirements? Thank you. Yes, uh, I'll try and answer the questions in order. Uh, first of all, the whole tech change, I think that's still under technical review. Um, so, so is it conceivable if that's not approved that that will delay? Well, it isn't approved yet, nor is it denied, so it's still under review, okay? Uh, the requirement for a public period for a license transfer is 30 days in the regulations. Uh, so that's what that's was published Excuse in the me, Federal I, Register. And so, it was never 60 days? No, it's 30 days. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, in response to the, I guess the lawsuit, your, uh, huh? yeah, it, uh, uh, we have no real comment on that. That is not part of our review. Uh, the only comment I would have uh, as a person that is an accusation of uh, of, of wrongdoing is not uh, not an assessment of guilt until the court decides it. So um, it's not part of our review at all. Thank you. Um, and I do want to say one thing that we as a we as a panel can request an extension on the public comment period if we needed to because we've done that in the past. So that that is an option. Yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Brad Furlan. I live in Fairfax, Vermont, born in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, I serve as president of the Vermont Energy Partnership. I want to thank Kate for hosting this meeting and NDCAP. Um, we appreciate that, and uh, we welcome the NRC. We've testified before you a number of times over the years and welcome you back to Vermont. The Vermont Energy Partnership was formed in 2005, uh, largely through the foresight of Governor Thomas Salmon. We're comprised of a diverse group of business, labor, and community leaders. And over the years, the Vermont Energy Partnership was a strong advocate for Vermont Yankee as an economic engine, a job provider uh, for not only Wyndham County, but for the state of Vermont, uh, supplying low-cost power. And we were in support of that. One of the things we heard over the years in debate was if Vermont Yankee closed, that um, an accelerated decommissioning would be desired. And lo and behold, with uh, North Star here, um, this this promise or this this desire can actually um, be be met. Um, so and and to make um, the site available for future economic uses. So we view this new opportunity of having Vermont Yankee acquired by North Star and have them put in place this accelerated and uh, safe de decommissioning process as great news for Vermont. We've had the opportunity to meet with North Star officials on a number of occasions and um, hear explanations of how they plan to operate in Vermont and decommission Vermont Yankee. Uh, 
we appreciate the fact that it's going to um, provide in segments um, jobs and economic stimulus for, for the region and for the state. And so for the NRC, we hope that North Star is properly vetted by this process in a fair, reasonable, and timely manner, timely manner, and that a green light is given to this sale and it signals to all an economic boost to Wyndham County and that you can do business in Vermont. So we thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce people's names. Um, Meredith Angwin and then Robert Stewart. Hello, my name is Meredith Angwin, and I live in um, I live in Wilder, Vermont, and I have blogged for many years at Yes Vermont Yankee. In case people are wondering what side of the fence I'm on, uh, I would like to just make a comment about the decommissioning, and that is that uh, while the plant was still running, and Governor Shumlin, at that point, he was governor, right, was very much against it. And he said at one point in a press conference that uh, if Vermont Yankee was decommissioned, it would be a huge jobs bonus for this area. It would be fabulous. And uh, it, it wouldn't actually lay people off because it would take the plant a couple years to cool, cool down and people would still be employed. Uh, he, uh, the polite way to describe this sort of thing is that he pulled this stuff out of the air. That's the polite way. At any rate, I was very interested in his comments, and I tried to figure out what actually happened in decommissioning. And in, during the course of this, I interviewed um, a lot of people at Three Yankees, at Energy Solutions. I read articles from EPRI. I read articles from all over the place. I used to work in the nuclear industry so I can figure some of these things out. And what I found out was that a lot of the data that I would have liked to find, but was really very wrapped up in, in the economics of the different c companies doing the decommissioning and was proprietary. So the idea that uh, this particular case, there's proprietary economic data and that's so, so shocking to some people, it's just standard. I mean, I wish it wasn't. Sometimes it, it wasn't standard. For example, I would have, I wanted to know what percentage of the decommissioning money actually went to truck drivers and to transport as opposed to people working on the site. This is proprietary data. I was told that by everybody and I think it's true and I think companies have a right to proprietary data. I, my, my point isn't that we should look more or look harder or look this or look that. My point is that decommissioning and many other processes like this do have proprietary economic data. This is not the first time, as I say, I was looking all over the country for this kind of data and it kept coming up proprietary because that's how it's handled. Great, thank you. I have um, Robert Stewart and then Patty O'Donnell. Yes, I'm Robert Stewart, although I go by Jake. Uh, and I live in Brookfield, Vermont. Uh, I'm a professional engineer, and I've been concerned about radioactivity ever since the plant started operation. And, and I'm particularly concerned now, uh, among other things, but about the rubbleization, if that becomes a possibility. I think that's a big mistake to leave radioactive material on site, even if it's diluted with other uh, less radioactive material to dilute it, uh, I think it all should be removed. The, uh, you know, diluting it is really not a solution. And the radioactive isotopes will migrate. They will get into the Connecticut River, and already are, and the, uh, they also will get into the uh, aquifer. They cannot be stopped, so I think the uh, less material that's radioactive on site, the, the better. So I hope that all of that material will be, as, as much as possible, can be removed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll have, um, after Patty, Janet Rasmussen. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming here tonight and giving us the opportunity to speak to you. 
Um, as Kate said, my name is Patty O'Donnell. I have, uh, I come from the town of Vernon, and I have over 20 years of experience of representing the town of Vernon in one way or another. Um, I've served on the school board, the select board, and I've been the state representative uh, for 12 years. And I have to say, coming from Vernon is not always an easy thing. It's not always easy to be the town with the nuclear power plant, although we have felt for years that we certainly um, helped the state out and our region out in many, many ways. Um, closing Vermont Yankee has been a very, very difficult thing for my town. It's really hard for a town of 2,100 people to try to figure out how do you go on. The most important people in this whole process, in this whole conversation, the ones who are going to benefit or hurt the most by the decisions that are made here is the town of Vernon. It's our community. We've struggled through an awful lot. And it's time to allow us to go on to our future. And going on to that future is decommissioning that plant. As a legislator, I heard for over 20 years, we want that plant decommissioned. We want that plant closed. Well, they got their way. The plant is closed. Now we want our way. We want a viable, fair, honest, um, looking into the proposal. If everything works out well, we want the plant decommissioned as fast as we can. You will hear after peers of mine in Vernon will tell you about our plans for the future and how we've been working very hard on our planning commission to reinvent ourselves, but nothing can be done until the plant is gone. We have already developed or started to develop a relationship with, with Sky. We had a wonderful relationship with Vermont Yankee. I know we will continue our relationship with North Star, and they're already working with us. But please, give us a chance for a future. We certainly have given our state enough in the last 42 years. Rasmussen, a resident of Vernon and a member of the Vernon Planning Commission. I think Patty said everything far more elegantly than I could. Oh. I'm Janet Rasmussen. I'm a resident of Vernon and also a member of the Planning Commission. I think Patty O'Donnell said what I would like to say a lot more elegantly than I could, but what I really want to underscore is we live in Vernon. We work in Vernon. Our economic future is dependent on this plan being, plant being decommissioned as quickly as possible, but also as safely as possible. No one has a seat closer at the table than we should because we live there. We are, the planning commission has become interveners in the process. We, are, we will read everything that we can. We have had permission from the select board to hire experts if we can to help us through the process. We're encouraged about the process thus far, and we hope that we are allowed to have a fair hearing. And please, no, no one wants this to happen more than us, economically and safely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Howard Schaefer and then Madeline Arms. And because it's raining, you do have to yell a little bit louder into the microphone. Oh, Howard's passing. So does Maddie want to go next? And next up is going to be Lissa Weinman. Madeline Arms, Town of Vernon, resident, and also member of the Planning Commission. Thank you very, very much for coming here and listening to everyone and taking all of our opinions and our hopes and our dreams into your consideration. I certainly would like to add my support to what Patty and Janet have said. This has been a topic of much discussion in the Planning Commission and throughout the town of Vernon, and I sincerely believe that it will not be just the town of Vernon that benefits from this revitalization. It's going to spread to the surrounding towns and to actually the whole state of Vermont as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. What's up? Hi, 
Hi, I'm Melissa Weinman. I'm a resident of Brattleboro, and again, I too appreciate you coming here tonight to hear views from our community. Um, I would say that, in my view, the town of Brattleboro is really the host town for the reactor. Vernon is, is the town where it is, but it's really the town of Brattleboro that, that absorbs a lot of the, um, the emergency preparedness and other things that have to do with the plant really emanate from Brattleboro. So I, I would say that, in my view, Brattleboro is the town of record here, um, more than Vernon. Uh, but I have a couple of things I just want to say quickly, which is I think that um, in this process, really, when there is a license transfer, that a new PSDAR should be completed. I think it's a new entity and, and really demands that a new PSDAR um, be put forth and not just a revised one. Um, I would also say that I have a lot of issues with the, um, the cost of the decommissioning. Um, Entergy thought it was going to be $1.2 billion. Our public service department did an independent assessment and they thought it would be along the lines of $2 billion to, to decommission the reactor. So those numbers are so wildly different. It's hard for the public to really reconcile, well, well what is real here? Um, I know that the overhead is going to come down and, and there's a lot of reasons why it's lower, but that's a lot lower and that calls into question the credibility of the numbers in my mind. Um, I just want to say also that I do believe that as long as the spent fuel um, is in the pool and the whole process of moving the fuel to dry fuel storage um, means that we should have an adequate level of emergency planning that the NRC has reduced. And I understand that decision's been made, but I take issue with that and I think it was a foolish decision. Um, I'd also like to, to just on record say that I think that allowing Entergy to use the decommissioning fund in ways that it has put forth was not also um, something that the community supported and I took issue with that, the NRC's decision with that as well. Um, I would like to, I know that you have an, uh, an environmental impact study that was generically done for this site. Lisa, but I don't want to brush you, but I'm okay. going to rush you. All right, well, two more points. <laughs> One is that, are any of the other um, re reactor sites have a school at the front door? Because I think that the presence of school children, who we know children are much more susceptible to um, radio radiation. I mean, they, they absorb it much differently than adults do. What are the measures that are going to be taken for the very unique circumstance that this plant is in and having a school at its doorstep? I don't think that's the case with any other plants anywhere. Um, and then finally, I would just say that uh, I'm against the rubbleization. Uh, it, it flies in the face of what Entergy had agreed to do, and while it may be acceptable for the NRC and federal standards, it's not what Entergy had promised in, in its agreement with the state. Um, so there's a lot of other things, but I'll put them in my written comments, and again, I appreciate your review. Bye. Great. Thank you. Um, <coughs> next up is going to be um, Bill Sayer and then Dan Jeffries. My name is Bill Sayre. I'm an economist from Bristol. My family has a lumber manufacturer, and as such, that better. And as such, I'm also representing Associated Industries of Vermont, which is the trade association for Vermont manufacturers. I want to thank you for making a trip up to Vermont to hear what we have to say, and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, I may take a different view, I will take a different view than some who will speak to you tonight. I want to start by expressing my, my association and my company's gratitude to Vermont Yankee and Energy Corporation for all the years of reliable, affordable, low carbon <laughs> energy that they provided to the manufacturers of Vermont. We appreciate it very greatly. And we now appreciate the agreement that they've reached with North Star to transition into a decommissioning process that will be more rapid and just as safe 
and just as high quality. We believe this is good for Wyndham County and it's good for Vermont. It secures the important safety and health standards that we all want to see, keeps the economy going, and gets the process completed in a more timely fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, after Dan Jeffries, it'll be um, Bob Spencer. Good evening. Thank the NRC for uh, making the trip up here. Um, we were kind of joking that down in the NRC, somebody must have asked for volunteers to come up to Vermont. But uh, <laughs> looks like they got some players. Appreciate your being here. Um, I got a question. Um, I'm, this is something I probably knew at one time, but have forgotten, and there's a reason for asking it. The question is, who owns the spent fuel, the dry casks, after the decommissioning is complete? Uh, one of the reasons that's on my mind is, uh, it seems to me that it would be appropriate for the Republican Congress uh, to pass a law forcing the ownership of those dry casks onto the Department of Energy. The federal government uh, said they would take this spent fuel way back in the 60s when they initially uh, allowed the industry to start building the nuclear power plant. So I think they should take it by law and not leave that open to uh, argument. Uh, number two question is, is North Star publicly held? And if so, how's business? And the reason I ask that question is that I'm an energy retiree. And when I was looking at my retirement plans, I was looking at how secure is this Entergy retirement check I'm going to be getting. Entergy is a large utility down south. Um, regardless of what might have happened with any of their nuclear power plants up here, I always felt that they were a very secure company and that my check was highly reliable. Um, if North Star is publicly traded and can comment on their you know, how things are going business-wise, I would expect that if they needed to bring more money to the table uh, for the next, you know, five years past 2026, 10 years past, if the cash flow is there, I consider the uh, finances secure. May not do much for the uh, stockholders if, in fact, it's publicly, publicly held, but if they've got the cash flow, it should come to Vermont Yankee if necessary. And the other thing that's on my mind, uh, by the way, I forgot to comment, I'm a uh, resident of Brattleboro. So one thing I've noticed in all the discussion is, and I can't quite get a grip on it, is what's so important about this 100 acres down here in Vernon. Uh, if you take a ride up and down the river, there's a lot of undeveloped land up and down the river. Why is this 100 acres so extremely important? It seems like this real estate's value is extremely exaggerated in my mind. And to that end, I'm comfortable with a four, four foot reclamation and I'm also uh, comfortable with the rebelization as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, it's um, Bob Spencer and then Peggy Farabaugh is next. Good evening and thank you to the NRC. Bob Spencer, I'm chair of the Vernon Planning Economic Development Commission. Uh, we've heard from three of our uh, members already. Uh, we also have uh, two other members here, um, Jeff Dunkley and also Martin Langeveld who's on the panel. So um, we um, are the, the board that's charged with looking at future use of this site and we recently prepared an op-ed piece that was put into the local papers. I was just going to hit a couple highlights of that. Um, that basically what we're looking at is a re-energized Vernon campaign. We like the idea that some of the other uh, decommissioned sites have hosted other ener en energy generating facilities. We are looking at such things as microgrid, battery storage, hydroelectric because of the existing Trans Canada now uh, arc light facility, um, possibly solar, and the spin-off businesses such as cloud storage and other high energy intensive uses. uses. Um, we also like to point out the over 100 year history of Vernon in hosting energy production, starting with the Vernon Hydroelectric Dam in the early 1900s and then transitioning into the 
nuclear power plant. So we feel we have a history and a mission, sort of, to keep hosting this sort of uh, uh, technology that benefits really three states and um, hundreds of thousands of people. The, um, this next chapter that we're talking about, we're, we're working um, through a number of municipal planning projects with the Wyndham Regional Commission to update our town plan, to look at hosting and facilitating development of such facilities. Um, we also are uh, amending our plan to make it, uh, give it something that the state has a new regulation that would give us a um, substantial deference in supporting or opposing uh, energy facilities. Um, so we're doing a lot that we feel will help facilitate redevelopment of this site. And we really are, as an intervener, as Janet said, we'll be commenting formally on this process and are cautiously optimistic that this deal will happen. So thank you, everyone, for your, your professional review and the due diligence from the private entities, too. Thank you. Um, after Peggy, it's going to be Betsy Williams and then Josh Unruh. Thank you, uh, Kate and panel, uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Peggy Faraba. I'm from Vernon, um, have lived there for 20 years. Um, my husband was laid off from Entergy, uh, so I'm coming from a point where a lot of people are in Vernon are coming from. We've suffered a lot from the shutdown of the plant, but the community has come together in an amazing way to uh, rebirth the town. And I've heard a lot of opinions um, tonight about how to do that, but none of them speak to me about the difference between the environmental health and safety of a plan that's six years versus 60 years. So uh, I am just encourage you on behalf of uh, the folks who I know in Vernon to make it sooner than later. I mean, in 60 years, all of us are going to be dead, right? And so in six years, this is something that could really help, like, my children and, and the children of other people from Vernon who are in this room. Um, so if there's no compelling safety, environment, uh, health, or financial reasons, please help us get this done in six years instead of 60. Thank you. Um, yeah, Betsy, and then Josh Unruh. Okay. Um, my thoughts are a little bit scattered. I'll try to keep it focused. Um, we've had a long history of interacting with various representatives from the NRC <coughs> in the past, and as uh, somebody said earlier, uh, I commend that, I don't know which um, raffle you won uh, to come up here. They haven't always been very pleasant uh, interactions in the past. I think one thing that's different this time is that in the past we were debating the continued operation of a plant, and now what we're talking about is how do we safely and efficiently and cost-effectively decommission it and decontaminate it. Um, we have a common goal. I think, every, I, think I, I guess I don't know, but I would assume that pretty much everybody in this room wants the same thing, which is we want that site to be cleaned up and cleaned up to the highest possible level it can and for that not to become a burden financially on anyone other than the owners of the, of the plant. Um, I think what we do debate is how we'll get there and how we'll get there in a way that we all can trust. Trust is a big issue here. Uh, we have lots and lots of reasons not to trust this company and lots and lots of reasons not to trust the NRC, quite frankly. We're talking about the most dangerous substance 
known to humankind that we are dealing with. I can appreciate that North Star has deconstructed many sites much larger and more involved than Vermont Yankee, but most of them were not dealing with the most dangerous substances known to humankind. We're talking about many of those substances leaving a legacy for up to a thousand generations. A thousand generations, that's our legacy. So what we do here in these next few years is really, really, really important. And it cannot be taken lightly. And I have frus been frustrated by decisions by the NRC in the past. For example, I do not believe that the whole tech decision that that was the cast to use on the site was the best decision. I don't believe that the NRC is committed to holding the, whichever company is involved in this process to the very highest possible standard known to humankind today. That's what they should be held to, not to what the last time I was at the NRC hearing, I was told by an NRC representative that the whole tech casts were adequate. I'm not looking for adequate. I don't think the people of Vernon or Brattleboro or anywhere in this tri-state region are looking for adequate. They are looking for the highest possible standard that we know of. And that's what I would like the NRC to be looking for as well. And I would like to feel assured that that is what the NRC is going to be holding whichever company accountable to. It concerns me greatly, as it does many others in this room, that my understanding, and I, I'm not completely sure of this, but my understanding is that most, if not all, of the decommissionings that have happened to date have had cost overruns. Almost all of them, if not all of them. While it would be wonderful if that did not happen here, I think that we clearly have to have an absolutely assured plan of what happens should that happen. And a company that has gone belly up, whether or not they're the owners, does not give me assurance of then who's gonna bear the burden of this very dangerous legacy. Betsy? And I'm about okay. to wind up, Kate. <laughs> so it also concerns me that what we're talking about here are two things that I think are, are in real competition with each other, which is we're trying to keep things to a certain cost, which makes sense, but we're also trying to do it at the most, the highest possible standard of safety that we know of, which usually also translates to being a more expensive process. The better casks are more expensive. The process for handling the materials in the most careful way is more expensive. And those two things are in direct contra you know, opposition to each other, and that is the very difficult path that we are navigating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, jo is Josh Unruh? Oh. Josh Unruh and then Haley Perro. And I just want to remind people if you could say your name and where you're from and keep your comments to about two minutes, that would be much appreciated. I can do that. I'm Josh Hunter, the Select Board Chair in Vernon. I'd like to thank everybody for their time this evening. To reiterate what has been said, there is no one with a stronger stake in this sale and the site's safe decommissioning than the town of Vernon. I stand in support of the sale of Vermont Yankee to North Star. I've had the opportunity to meet with the North Star executives regarding their purchase and their potential new partnership with the town of Vernon. Through these conversations, my personal questions and concerns have been put to rest. Among many, uh, among many things over the last several months we've heard, and, and we've also heard it tonight, is concerns about the school across the street from Vermont Yankee. The funny thing is, is that none of these people have children at Vernon Elementary School. I do. I have three little girls at Vernon Elementary School. <clears throat> I'm no scientist. I'm no demolition expert. So I put my trust in the people that deal in this industry day in and day out that will govern the sale and demolition. That's the NRC and North Star. To get this land back to a usable state safely is paramount for Vernon and Southern Vermont for economic development. 
to not allow this sale is further cutting the town of Vernon and Southern Vermont off at its knees. Thank you. After Haley, we're going to have Ann Darling and then Leo Schiff. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. My name is Haley Perro, and I work in Senator Bernie Sanders' office. Tonight, I'm joined by my colleagues Tom Barry in Senator Leahy's office and George Twig in Congressman Welch's office. On behalf of the delegation, we'd like to thank the NRC for making the trip to Vermont to hear directly from Vermonters. We think that's very important. And we'd also like to thank the panel for making this meeting possible and also for being a conduit for uh, public information. The delegation has long believed that public engagement is really critical to this process, so it's uh, terrific to see so many members of the public here tonight. As many of you may know, Bernie has introduced legislation a few years ago to make sure that local and state input is a meaningful and formal part of the decommissioning process, particularly on the PSDAR. Bernie will soon be reintroducing this bill and including an, uh, an opportunity for the public to give input on license transfers so that in situations like we find ourselves, the public will still have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. And again, thanks to the uh, congressional delegation. Uh, they were very helpful in getting um, the NRC to come here this evening. Anne. Hi, I'm Ann Darling. I live in East Hampton, Massachusetts, which is down the river. And, uh, but for, until a few years ago, I was a 35-year resident of this area. And uh, I consider myself, this is my home. Um, so I guess, um, you know, we're, the Vermont Yankee site, it's in the corner of Vermont, but it's right close to Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So um, the state has jurisdiction, the state of Vermont has jurisdiction over the non-radiological aspects of uh, decommissioning. Uh, the, the residents all over this area, all different states, not just Vermont, will um, kind of bear the brunt or the, ha feel the impact of the operation, the shutdown, the decommissioning, all that. So my, I'm asking the, the NRC what your commitment is to uh, communicating with all of these parties and coordinating, uh, particularly with the state of Vermont, um, but all, all of us uh, as moving forward. Uh, it's kind of germane to what you were just saying. Uh, we have, these are our lives, so we want you to talk to us. <laughs> I, I would, need to ask a question. Yeah, would you folks like to respond? <coughs> Keep forgetting the microphone, I'm so sorry. I'll try, and, and Kate, I'll try and be brief. Um, to answer your question about what our commitment is on being transparent and communicating, uh, transparency is another one of the NRC's cornerstones. Um, I don't know how else to say it more clearly. I can tell you, um, as a, the deputy director in the decommissioning division, it's extremely important to me as well. It's why we're here. It's why um, you have four of us sitting up here today. Um, and, and so you do have our commitment. It is part of um, what's in, extremely important to us. Everything we do should be transparent. Um, and it is, I don't know if nice is the right way to put it, but it is nice and striking to me to, to sit here and listen to concerns, questions, comments, no matter what side of the issue that you're on. Um, I, it's extremely important to me, and um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. I just want to say that, like my friend Betsy, uh, many, many times we've sat with the NRC. We haven't, some of us have not felt that, uh, that we were more important than the industry, the nuclear industry. Uh, and so, um, I, you're gonna run into that. And we don't just want transparency, we want you to really listen and take our opinions into consideration. We want our, what we say to have an impact. And that means people of Vernon and everybody else that lives here. Uh, we, wanna, we want you to listen and do something about what we think. Thank you, Ann. Um, after Leo, it's going to be Guy Page and then Bob Leach. Hi there. My name's Leo Schiff. I live in Brattleboro, and uh, 
I really appreciate the representatives of the NRC coming. Uh, I understand that this might be your last trip ever to Brattleboro. And uh, because of that, I've got a question for you that is a little bit tangential to the sale of the property. First, I want to locate myself as firmly against nuclear weapons and nuclear power and in favor of long-term on-site stewardship of the dry casks in Vernon. What I'd like to ask you is what makes you so sure that it would be safe to transport the highest level nuclear waste and other medium or low level nuclear waste along our decaying rail lines and with the possible threats of terrorism. Do you have any other questions, Leo? Uh, no, but I'd love to get an answer. Okay, great, thank you. Um, your question is uh, pertaining to the safe transportation of radioactive materials. Uh, I can assure you that it's done almost every day in this country, uh, whether it's in the commercial business or in the Defense Department. Uh, there's strict requirements on the condition of the rails, the roads, et cetera, which those materials would be transported, uh, and, and, and significant security requirements, especially for the transportation of spent fuel. Um, so I, I can tell you it's done safely and frequently in this country um, all the time. Uh, may not ever be every day. I've personally been involved in a number of them, uh, and uh, the, the lengths that are taken for the security and the routing and the safety of the packages and the transportation are extensive. Thank you. Guy Page, Berlin, Vermont, Vermont Energy Partnership. So welcome back to Vermont. Last time you were here, I think the room was about 45 degrees, if I remember correctly. Uh, and uh, just so you know, uh, tonight the last arc leaves at 10, with all the rain. Uh, so anyway, uh, as I think Mr. Toomey pointed out, uh, the decommissioning trust fund is 572 million. The expenses of the North Star plan, as I understand it, are about 498 million. So that's about a $74 million surplus. That's pretty good. Uh, additional cost overrun, risk mitigation, you've got some guaranteed fixed payments and bonding, team performance bonds, team contractual commitments, and $125 million support agreement, basically an insurance policy. And you know, you guys are gonna be doing the deep dive on, you know, on the, the ability of, of the company to, to uh, you know, have the financial wherewithal and the technical skill and all that. But this service, that seems like that's a good prudent plan. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we've really got to look at North Star's past and their future. They, they've de decommissioned hundreds of power facilities, you know, we've seen all these. And as I've been Googling them, I, I haven't found any accounts of, you know, oh boy, they really messed up this one. I, I, I haven't found any of those, okay? Uh, and it seems that they've got a pretty good record. Uh, extensive experience in nuclear decommissioning, uh, and, and really, in terms of failing questions were asked, well, what happens if you find something you didn't think you were going to find? And I thought Mr. State's answer was a good one. But really, you don't become a world leader by failing to see and deal with the unforeseen. That's just a, a characteristic of, of, a, of a business success is you, you know how to deal with these things. So I'm, I, my sense is that, that they do. Uh, and, and a big question I think you really need to ask is, okay, what's the alternative? The alternative is 60 years, South Store, as Peggy said, you know, we're, we're all dead by the time this thing's done. Uh, so uh, I, I, I know you're going to do due diligence on this, and I know the Public Service Board is going to do diligence, and that's all very good, that's all very necessary, but I just hope the, the take on this is we want to we get to yes, okay, because it's, it's good for the community. It's, even good for the environment, and I just hope it gets done. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. I just want to assure everybody, if you've signed up to speak, you will get to speak, so don't, don't worry about that. Um, after Bob, 
Leach, we're going to have Paul Blanche. Evening. Evening. My name is Bob Leach. I'm a Brattleboro resident, and I strongly support the transfer of the license and the sale of uh, Vermont Yankee to North Star. <coughs> I'm a Vermont Yankee retiree. For many years, I was the RPM, the Radiation Protection Manager. I was also certified a reactor operator, senior reactor operator. I'm a plank owner. For those that don't know the Navy terminology, that's anybody that was there when they commissioned. I was there when there was still a hole in the ground. I've looked into North Star and the team that's working on this uh, project. It's North Star, WSC, and Areva. Areva is an international company. They've been building power plants, nuclear power plants, around the world for as long as I can remember. They're a very respectable company. They have an outstanding reputation <coughs> in the nuclear industry. Excuse me. WSC is an operator of the radioactive waste disposal site down in Texas. Vermont, or Vermont and Texas are the compact folks that established that particular site. WSCS operates that facility and they do it in a safe and professional manner. They will be an extremely valuable asset in the process of uh, preparing, scheduling, and shipping the huge amount of radioactive waste this is going to be leaving for Miami. North Star has reputation for decommissioning non-nuclear power plants for years. They were used as a major subcontractor in one of the um, Midwest power plants, and everything I heard from that, they were doing an outstanding job. They did operate and successfully decontaminate a nuclear facility that was not a power plant. They did some work at Vermont Yankee recently. <clears throat> it was essentially the removal of the North Warehouse. Some of you are aware of that building. That was the first building at Vermont Yankee that received any radioactive waste or radioactive material. And it was used to store radioactive material right up until it was, uh, was decommissioned. They bought in a professional crew, relatively small crew. They bought in the right equipment, and they completed the job on schedule and on budget. North Star and their partners are very capable, knowledgeable, and they've got extensive experience in this kind of job. Bob, I'm going to have they, to move you along. Okay. I won't. I won't gong you or anything like that. But oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Let's end with just saying they've got the expertise and the ability, and I strongly support giving them the chance to do it. I would like to ask one question. Sure. The NRC. It's kind of different. I understand the state of Vermont is trying to become or looking into becoming an agreement state. I think I know the answer, but if they do become a Greenham state, would they, I know that the NRC regulates power plants, but decommissioning is slightly different, and would Vermont be obligated in any way if they become an agreement state? That's a yes, no question. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Thank you. Part 50 licenses are the responsible of the NRC to regulate. Thank you. Okay, after um, Paul Blanche, we're going to have Kyle Landis Marinello and then Clay Turnbull. Good evening. Thank you, members of the panel and Madam Chairman. My name is Paul Blanche. I reside in West Hartford, Connecticut, about 70 miles south of the plant. I'm, a, uh, I'm going to cut my speech uh, in the interest of time a little bit short, but I have passed out copies to members of the panel and also to Andrea of the NRC, so I'm going to cut out the uh, major part of it, uh, as Mark McDonald so eloquently uh, described my concerns. Uh, I'm a professional engineer with more than 50 years of nuclear safety experience and regulatory experience. I've worked at Maine Yankee during the decommissioning, at Connecticut Yankee during the decommissioning, and I sat on a similar panel overseeing the decommissioning of uh, Millstone Unit 1. 
So I have quite a bit of experience in, in regulatory issues and a limited amount of uh, experience in uh, decommissioning. But I was going through the regulations and it was just briefly mentioned in one of the NRC slides, but no one seems to have amplified in it, on it. And I have a couple extra copies, and that's 10 CFR 50.75. So I would like the panel to review that. It has to do with financial um, stability of the licensee and guarantee of decommissioning funds. So. Following up from Mark's uh, dialogue, I'd like to make some recommendations to the panel that Vermont must consider the requirements of some type of, quote, surety method, insurance, or other guaranteed method, close quote, as required by 10 CFR 50.75 as a condition for transfer of the Vermont Yankee license. Vermont's attorneys and the panel must determine the amount of the surety bond required to assure Vermont is financially protected. Typical amounts for performance type bonds are equal to the fixed contract amount. However, this particular job is not a typical contract. Vermont's attorneys must review the license transfer and the regulations of 50.75 to assure the financial protection should North Star fail to perform. Vermont must oppose the license until it is satisfied and it is protected from non-performance or bankruptcy in accordance with the requirements of 50.75. A couple of statements were made by Scott about indemnification. If there is indemnification or bonding, uh, certainly that kind of statement needs to be in writing and um, uh, checked out. And the other thing that somewhat bothered me by um, some of uh, North Star statements were the amount of contamination they have removed from various sites. And I don't disagree, they have removed contamination, but nuclear contamination is not the same as lead, asbestos, PCBs. It has its own characteristics, and they need to have that expertise that power plant expertise on board to assure a safe decommissioning. Thank you, Thank Paul. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle Landis Marinello and then Clay Turnbull. I'm Kyle Landis Marinello. I'm an assistant attorney general for the state of Vermont. Uh, our office is looking at this transaction closely. Uh, this is a matter that the Attorney General was briefed on on day one when he, when he took office. The Attorney General's office is participating in the proceeding at the Public Service Board, along with the Agency of Natural Resources and the Public Service Department, and with some consultation with the Department of Health as well. We plan to participate in the proceeding at the NRC, along with all of those agencies. Generally, we want this site cleaned up quickly, and the transaction looks good for that reason. But this transaction needs to be fully vetted. We need to ensure, one, the site is going to be fully cleaned up, and two, that the cost of that cleanup do not fall on Vermonters. A full vetting requires more information. For instance, there's a line item in the new decommissioning plan of $223 million for decontamination and dismantlement. That's very different from the line-by-line -line breakdown that was provided in the original decommissioning cost estimate. A second example, the spent fuel costs for this transfer assume that the Department of Energy will pick up all of the fuel by 2052. There's no guarantee that will happen. <laughs> if it doesn't happen, there could be massive costs, particularly if we reached the 100 year mark where dry casts would possibly need to be repackaged. And even if the pickup occurs by 2052, there's a chance that the Department of Energy is gonna require different casts for transportation. These type of costs need to be looked at and 
there needs to be an answer of where those costs would come from. So there is more information needed to fully vet this transaction. Uh, I was encouraging to hear that the NRC still has the availability of requests for additional information and we would support the NRC availing itself of that to provide more information to itself and to the public about how this transaction will do what everyone wants it to do and get the site cleaned up quickly. Thank you, Kyle. Um, we're going to have Clay Turnbull. And then after Clay, we're going to have Gary Sachs. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming up to Vermont. So it's, this is a, a warm welcome. Yeah. Um, I hope in, in not too many years, you folks at NRC are going to be able to if, almost brag that you were up at this meeting in Vermont because the decommissioning turned out so successful in Vermont that it's, it's like, it's what people talk about. And you'll be able to say, yeah, we were there early in that process. Um, in, a, in a complex project like this, to be successful, it is essential to know what the goal is. And in this case, that, that is like, what will the site look like post decommissioning? And I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Clay Turnbull, I live in Townsend, and it's been a long time since I said, and I proudly live in a solar powered home for 25 years um, off grid. And uh, why not see if we can do the job here of decommissioning? Can it be done? Can it be done while honoring the commitments that Entergy has already made to the state of Vermont? We're presented with one option is let it rust. The other option to wait 60 years. The, another option is let's rush into this and get it. Let's, we, we need to do this now. It's got to be done by the end of the month. You know, make your decisions right away. The, the rush or rust um, uh, option. Or another option is you can have a green field. 60 years from now, Entergy's going to honor their commitments. They're not going to rubbleize. You're going to have a really beautiful site in 60 years or so. Decommissioning will be done. Or you can get a brownfield and we'll do it now. And it's an, it's, we're given these, these greenfield or brownfield or rush or rust options. What if we all had the goal of making that site just as clean as possible, at least as clean as Maine Yankee, um, so that we can all look back and, and not too far down the road. It would be really wonderful to have that site decommissioned and, and 10 years from now be saying, what a great job we did. So I say, how about we start with, with that as a goal um, in mind? Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Um, after Gary, we're going to have um, R.T. Brown and then Laurie Cartwright. Um, thanks for coming up, uh, NRC. Um, Mr. State, I'm a little bit, uh, I haven't been to these meetings, many of them, because I was undergoing chemotherapy. And I would, I remember Chairman Yasko of the NRC came and met with the activists a few years ago. I sure would like to meet Mr. State to get some answers questions, because it seems like this whole thing that's based in proprietary data, you know, if Entergy's, I mean, I'm sorry, if, North Star Entergy, they're so close to each other. If North Star disappears 2028, let's say, what do we do, go back to proprietary information? I don't see how that works. I'd like to understand more. I, uh, Mr. Marinello, Kyle Lance Marinello, spoke about that line item piece in the original, and I didn't see that in the current PSDAR, but needless to say, I haven't started. <sighs> 2007. The World Business Academy wrote, if private investors won't buy into nuclear, why should the public? In 2007, Entergy tried to spin off its reactors into a company called Spinco. In 2009, Entergy officials were found to have misspoken. Punishment was minimal, financial, or not at all. 
Um, what happened is that Entergy, after the misspeaking of 2009, promised to be honest and forthcoming. Then it shut down. How sad that we here in Vermont never got the chance to believe or experience Entergy making good on their promises to be honest and forthright with us. However, they have come up at election day this past year. Hey, we found somebody to buy our reactor. Where the heck was North Star when Entergy was trying to sell the reactor for all those years? How come you didn't buy in then? What is this crap now? I mean, so in election day 2016, Entergy made, I mean, found a buyer. Here's North Star. Is Entergy hiding responsibility for its poor purchase decisions? Where was North Star when Entergy had the reactor on sale? What insurance does the NRC have that Mr. State can provide uh, that there are no potential liens into him for perhaps millions of dollars from previous court cases or endeavors? I'd like to know that before this happens. Arriva is being bailed out by the French government. WCS is already involved here per the compact, so to have them as part of this North Star is kind of redundant. But Burns and McDonald's always good to get a discount. Okay, I perceive the VY settlement agreement as an ultimatum. If it wasn't accepted verbatim, it would not have been approved. It would not have been passed into law. That's not a negotiation. That's an ultimatum. The P this PSDAR means very little, in a sense because the NRC doesn't approve it. It's simply that North Star has to do it. Uh, it's like there's a box they have to check off between here and the decision. Uh, is there an ISPASI pad being built right now? It started in April. As per the, great, good. Uh, I believe this North Star deal is to, well, I'll leave that for the last. Okay. <laughs> Vernon has been pro-VY for 42 years. Can we let them have the waste? I mean, many of the Vernon residents, I mean no disrespect, had said, we'll take the dry casks. Let's let them have some, not have to put it all in the concrete, give it all to make you guys responsible. Gary, I'm going to ask you to speak. Great. Very quickly, okay. I have two things. Uh, I need a picture from you guys, either Entergy or North Star, how much of that site is going to be visible or going to be usable for people. A 125-acre site. Maine Yankee has a lot of site that's not accessible because of the ISPASI. Can we get a picture? Would you guys like to see a picture? To see if there's actually going to be a recreational area? Have you seen it? A projected, a projected picture of what it'll look like. Have you seen it? Panel. No, thank you. I'd like to see that prior to whatever transfer occurs. I'd like Mr. State to be more forthcoming. I know I'm sorry I was going through cancer, but I give you guys responsibility. Um, I think this entire deal is to line Mr. State's pockets. Thank you. Um, R.T. Brown and then Lori Cartwright, and then we're going to have Rich Holsuch next after them. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you to the panel, the NRC, and to North Star for being here tonight. I've timed myself to a minute and a half. Let's see if I can achieve this. Um, closer. Good evening. My name is R.T. Brown. I work for the Brattleboro Development Credit Corporation, and I'm the Wyndham County Economic Development Programs Project Manager. I also administer some programs related to entrepreneurship and innovation in the region. The BDCC is one of 12 regional development corporations throughout the state, and we serve uh, the Wyndham region. Our sister entity, uh, the Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategies developed the region SEDS, or Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. It's essentially our roadmap uh, for the region, our economic development roadmap. My academic and professional background is in applied economics as it relates to local and regional development. We entirely support the expedited process as proposed by North Star as an accelerated timeline by decades. Um, poses many opportunities for the community in the region. Due to the accelerated timeline and speaking from the perspective of re regional economic development entity, it should be noted that this, this places a greater pressure on the town of Vernon, which has very limited resources, to sufficiently and clearly plan and develop the best possible long-term reuse of the site. There is an opportunity here to think about Vernon's infrastructure and what, what can be done to provide the greatest possible long-term economic impact for what has been a very supportive rural host community. I think it was said very well in the last PSB meeting 
uh, by someone, and my apologies, I don't, I don't know their name. But essentially the idea is that North Star has a tremendous opportunity to show their leadership in this field that is only going to grow. We encourage the parties here to put the community first and do everything possible to not simply meet expectations but exceed them in ways that exhibit innovation, thoughtfulness, and leadership as the next chapter of nuclear power generation is written starting in Vernon, Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, RT. Lori Cartwright, and then after Rich, it's going to be Peter Vanderdose. I apologize I wasn't closer. It happened faster than I expected. I am Lori Cartwright, and I am from Brattleboro, Vermont. I would also like to take this chance to thank the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for coming to Brattleboro to speak to us and to hear us. As a taxpayer, a citizen of this great state and nation, a mother, and a fierce proponent of truly renewable energy, solar, wind, and hydro, I would like nothing more than to see this site be cleaned up as expeditiously and safely as possible, especially if it paves the way for the site to be made available for the production of such truly renewable forms of energy. It would be a boon to the local economy. It seems that what divides some of the people that we've heard from tonight from Vernon from some of the other people we've heard from tonight is this notion of having the site be released um, on an unrestricted basis. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission representatives outlined what some of the decommissioned uh, sites look like, but I, I wish that when I'm done with my comment they would uh, just go over that point again because I was always under the conception that there aren't any um, former commercial reactor sites that have been unrestricted and um, that would include the entire site of the former commercial reactor. So if, if somebody from the NRC could articulate that for us again at the end of my comment period, I would, I would really appreciate it. I do again think that that is the deep divide and for something this important, I think that, uh, frankly, I don't see there being anything more important facing this world right now than the cleaning up of nuclear power plant sites and the storage of the high level, medium level, low level, any level radiated waste. Um, it's the most critical issue for all of us. So if we could have a better understanding about the real feasibility of seeing that site cleaned up and redeveloped in our lifetimes, I think that that would be really helpful for everyone here to get closer to what it is that they want at the end of this. I do have concerns about some of the ways that the um, proposed purchaser is going to want to go about cleaning up the site and I won't spend a lot of time talking about it. I apologize. I'm just, I'm really emotional about this because like I said, I can't consider anything more important to us than this. Um, but rubbleization is a concern that is diluting the pollution. Um, um, Laura, I'm going to have to ask you okay. to wrap it up. Okay. And then I just, I do want to say that it was great concern to me that one of the representatives from North Star suggested that they saw this sort of a cleanup the same as any other site, that the fact that it was a radioactive site really didn't make that much of a difference to them. I think that that makes all of the difference in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. There, there was a question, I think, to the NRC. Yes, let me uh, go ahead and uh, follow up on that. Um, of the uh, sites that have been decommissioned, uh, all 10 of them have been released for unrestricted use, meaning the owner can do what they want to on them. 
uh, a few of them that which the fuel was removed completely before uh, by the department where the fuel was removed by the Department of Energy are fully open to any redevelopment that they want to. That would include Shoreham, Pathfinder, uh, Saxton. Um, about one third have become parks or some other use, like Main Yankee. I, I mentioned that one before. Um, there are a number of plants where they have built additional uh, fossil units. Uh, at Rancho Seco, they have two combined uh, uh, fossil units, uh, combined cycle, they use gas or whatever fuel they want to use. At Humboldt Bay, they have uh, 10 combustion units, which they use for uh, stabilizing the grid in Northern California. And at La Crosse, uh, both Humboldt Bay and La Crosse right now are undergoing decommissioning, but La Crosse has a uh, large uh, coal powered plant uh, right next to the nuclear plant. So the sites can be reused for a variety of purposes, it's really up to the owner. Just a point of clarification, sir. Thank you. Um, the sites where the fuel has not been removed, are those um, fully unrestricted sites? Yes, except for the fuel facility, the storage facility. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's your turn, Rich. Quite <laughs> Into the busy lit stand, the fantastic Akutsi Sokwa Kik. My name is Rich, and I'm from this place, namely Brattleboro. I serve on the Vermont Commission for Native American Affairs. I work with the contemporary Native community in the state of Vermont. I'm here as spokesperson for the Elnu Abenaki tribe, with the backing of the Nohegan and the Koasek. Thank you for traveling here to Wantastagak and Sokwakik, the land of the people who separated, the southwesternmost part of Indakina, the Abenaki homeland. As indigenous people, our concern is both for the land and the people, for they are the same. I would like to open with a short perspective of how we see this situation. You may not have heard this before. I don't know. Then I'd like to make three brief comments, not questions, just comments. This, tonight, this gathering, is the latest step in a story that has been unfolding for less than 50 years, blink of an eye. The spiritual beliefs of the indigenous people tell us that time is a whole, not a linear progression. We are all part of the same. There is no separation from anyone or anything else, no matter the time or the shape, only a relationship and a different way of being in the world. Energy and matter are conserved, basic physics. Everything matters. The past is always with us and the future is now. We have a great responsibility as native people and hopefully as human beings to honor these relationships and conduct ourselves in a manner befitting our role in creation. But now, we have some new strange things, things that have never been here before, things that we can't see, but they're still real, radionuclides that are not a part of natural law. They have never been here before in these quantities. They are antithetical to life itself. They don't fit. They're not part of the story, the story that's been going on for millennia. But yet here they are. Somebody made a decision to step outside of relationship, and now we have to live with it. The deliberations of the moment, today, the next few weeks, years, will be with us for hundreds and thousands of years. Seems like a long time, and it is. I ask you to remember that the Abenaki and their ancestors have been in this land, the land where Vermont Yankee sits, for 12,000 years. That's a long time. They've been flourishing sustainably within the relationship, and with thankfulness, we are still here. Asqua and Odibana, Yodali, as we say in our language. And we want to honor this place, our homeland. We want the future generations to be able to give thanks in the same manner and enjoy these gifts as well. We ask that you make these decisions 
regarding the disposition of this great incongruity carefully. It affects everyone and everything. So I'd like to make three short comments. Rich, they do have to be short. Okay. These are with respect to the PSDAR. Vermont Yankee sits on an ancient gathering place, a place for settlement, gathering, fishing, working the land, performing ceremony, and a final resting place when it came time to walk on. The cultural significance of the site has never been fully acknowledged. I don't know if everybody knows this, but that's the case. North Star should know this. The original 1972 Atomic Energy Commission license for the plant makes it very clear, stating, quote, no formal archaeological survey was conducted at Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Station prior to initial construction. And yet, for one example, historic newspaper accounts record the unearthing of multiple indigenous burials in the immediate area for the 200 years immediately preceding the facility. I'll leave it at that. This needs to be on the record. The PSDAR and the revised PSDAR merely quote the license that came before, and it's all made up, it's a myth. Second point, environmental review procedures that have been put in place at Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power Station regarding undertakings that involve land disturbing activities, this is beyond decommissioning, undisturbed areas, require a notification procedure involving the State Historic Preservation Officer to establish the act actions necessary to protect uh, known or undiscovered cultural resources. This is going to carry through in site restoration as well. There's going to be a lot of staging areas, a lot of storage areas beyond the plant itself. We request the tribes be included in these procedures going forward <coughs> and the protocols that will accompany them. And the last point, environmental justice. Executive Order 12898 from 1994 directs federal executive agencies to consider environmental justice under the National Environmental Policy Act it is designed to ensure low income and minor minority populations do not experience the dis disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects. Now we all know where the nuclear waste sites are. They are settled, they are set in areas with marginalized, usually indigenous people. While you're considering how this is going to take place and where these things are going to go, we want you to know that we stand with these people. We ask that you consider their lives equally and fairly as your responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Vanderdose and then Nancy Browse. I think uh, Nancy Browse has left us. Uh, Peter Vanderdoes from Brattleboro. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Ms. O'Connor for her very concise and intelligent question, who will be left holding the bag? And Senator McDonald's point that the people holding the bag will have empty pockets. Um, uh, Mr. Leach, who was here earlier and spoke uh, so eloquently of Areva, I would like to point out uh, some of their uh, shortcomings in cost and time overrides. The Flamanville uh, nuclear plant in France, which began construction in 2007, was supposed to be finished in 2012, is still under construction today. Initially, it was estimated at 3.5 billion euros but the cost has ballooned to 10.5 billion euros. Another point is the Okaledo nuclear power plant in Finland, uh, which Areva was working on, was due to be finished in 2009. It is also still under construction, and the initial cost has gone up from 3.5 billion euros to 8 billion euros. The Finnish electrical utility, TVO, is taking Areva to court. Um, I had a whole uh, bunch of uh, financial uh, information um, which I was going to go through, but it was very lengthy. So I decided just to uh,
point out uh, to the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, 10 CFR uh, 50.38, the ineligibility of certain applicants. Any person who is a citizen, national, or agent of a foreign country, or any corporation or other entity which uh, the commission knows to be owned, controlled, or dominated by an alien foreign corporation or foreign government shall be ineligible, ineligible to apply for or obtain a license. Um, so I know that that's sort of pushed under the rug because Areva has done a lot of work in the United States. But I'm wondering, why shouldn't an American corporation be doing that work? We need the jobs. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. Nancy Browse appears to have left the building. Um, is there anyone else who hasn't signed up or I missed you that would like to make a comment? Yes, please come to the microphone. My name is Audrey Fumet. I'm a member of the Vermont Yankee Decommissioning Alliance. I understand that North Star is partnering with the Texas-based WCS to send our high-level nuclear waste to a community in Andrews County, Texas. Our group, along with other citizen-based groups, recently sponsored residents from Andrews County who are very opposed to receiving our high-level <coughs> nuclear waste. They're concerned that although they're told this is interim storage, there is presently no safe long-term plans for high-level nuclear waste storage. They're concerned about environmental impacts or potential terrorist attacks on this waste. I mean, this is where they live and where they're raising their children. They stated they had no nuclear power plants and yet they're hosting our waste. I'd like everyone to consider what's being proposed and the people that will be affected by our poisonous waste for possibly generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who hasn't made a comment but would like to? Yes, please come to the microphone. <coughs> Hi, uh, uh, Steve Zaluzny, uh, a resident of Vernon, Vermont. Um, just a quick a little bit of history. My father was a select person for years in Vernon. Um, he was there when they built the plant, along with other uh, select people, obviously. And uh, spent a lot of time and had a lot of late night meetings, uh, one or two o'clock in the morning, to uh, deal with a nuclear power plant coming to town. Um, so I don't want to bore you with too much of that, but uh, uh, one of the promises that was made, obviously, and I don't know all the background or the paperwork or the, you know, the legal documents, but the, the people of Vernon were promised that the nuclear waste would be uh, removed once the plant was shut down. So that obviously has become an issue. Um, the deep. Uh, the, the AG mentioned that, you know, what, what will happen after a certain year, 52 or whatever, as far as cost, and I guess before I get done, maybe that's a question I'd like answered, you know, and who pays that cost of, of material on site um, as it goes beyond a certain point, I mean, I guess, and then now I want to speak a little bit about just the idea of, you know, I'm a small contractor, obviously, uh, but certain things are also relevant, small or big, as far as construction contracts. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, if you're doing a bonded job, obviously a bond sounds like a good thing, and it can be, uh, but if there's any disputes, a bond could be contested, and then you're in a, a legal situation trying to deal with it. Um, I guess my comments in regard to a contract are, Obviously, up front, you need to know what the costs are, okay? That's critical, especially in this case. So whoever we're going to trust, uh, public service or, or the NRC or whoever it is, we need to know what the costs are accurately before the contract is signed and the work is done. 
once that's established, uh, a schedule of values has to be set. That is basically what the cost of each segment of the job will be. Um, once the work proceeds, uh, and it's critical that the contractor is paid accordingly to what work is done as far as its value. Uh, if a contractor would be overpaid, that's not a good situation. So that is why whoever will oversee this is able to measure the work that's done and that it's done properly. That way if a contractor defaults, uh, there's still enough money left to finish the work. Um, so that is also critical. Um, so I think that's really important to, to any contract. Obviously this is has nuclear uh, uh, waste involved, but um, the, these uh, requirements are, are still relevant for any contract. And I think that's what I as a resident of Vernon want my government to do uh, in this situation that they scrutinize and uh, make sure that the contract is followed and that's really going to make this work. Whether it's done over six years or 60 years, that still has to happen to this, for this to work. So now again to my question on storage, whoever should try to answer that as far as cost and who pays the cost of storage if it were. If, if we don't have a place to put uh, nuclear waste, you know, in you know, in the time span, we're hoping that will happen. I recognize your concern about spent fuel, and I want to remind everyone in this room that we do not make policy as to what is going to be the disposition of spent fuel. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission only maintains that there be held safely, securely, and all the other issues. I can tell you that there is going to be some point where if there is no resolution found for spent fuel, there will be additional costs. Um, but a lot of things will have to transpire between now and then. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. There is sufficient funding right now under the guidance given by the Department of Energy, and I grant you that the Department of Energy has not had a very good track record as to what their promises are or not. That's a fact. But there will become a point, and I'm not going to deny it, that at some time, sometime, additional funding will have to be found. The problem that we're going to be having is that they're not going to be necessarily popular answers. The licensee would still be held responsible for all costs, because the license for the ISFC, or the dry craft storage, is not terminated until such time that the fuel is removed. So I cannot sit here and tell you what the costs are to an infinite time. Um, there's very little way that I could do that for you. All I can say is that if it's going to happen, um, the licensee will be responsible for the costs. Now, and an added point to this, uh, many of the licensees have been uh, suing the Department of Energy to reclaim some of these costs, and they have been winning in court. Uh, there's also been, unfortunately, not necessarily a very good um, payment on these judgments. Um, I don't have answers to what's going on with the Department of Energy. All I can tell you is that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does not make that policy. So one way or the other, as we've been talking about throughout the evening, the licensee is responsible for the costs until the license is terminated completely. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your, your answer. Thank you. I think there was one more person who wanted to comment. Yes. I was reluctant to come up because I... You have to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Tina Olson. And I live in Brattleboro. I came here from New York City. I've been here three years. I grew up in Massachusetts, but I belong here. This is, these are my people, this is my land. I love the Connecticut River. 
and I'm a music therapist, and so of all the details that is involved here, I don't know much. But what I hear is that we share a future. And I think probably deep down all of us love the land. Um, so it seems to me after listening, this comes down to a commitment to do the absolute best to save the land and ourselves and the future. And I also understand that there really isn't a satisfactory way to, to store this terrible curse in a way. Um, so, and I felt like I do need to say something in honor of our democracy and I appreciate all of us here together which I think deep down we share the same desire and uh, that we can come together and hear each other. So I don't normally do this, but I felt that I need to speak. And um, I think all I can say is let us do the best we can in a way, even if it is the most expensive, and even if it takes a long time, because we do love the land and our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the public that wants to make a comment or has a question? Right, thank you so much. I want to thank, well, we're not done the meeting, but I want to thank the public um, for coming this evening. I think it was important and it was because of the public that we asked the NRC to come here this evening. So I, I want to thank all of you for showing up and it's, I think it's very instructive for us as a panel to hear what, what you are thinking and what your thoughts and concerns are because that's part of what we, we'd like to know as well. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, if you wanna make a comment and you didn't wanna do it in this forum or you go home tonight and you think of something that you wanna say, the NRC is accepting comments on the license transfer until June 23rd. And again, you can go on the NRC website or um, what we'll be doing is emailing you out. Okay. The, could I, this is Jack Parrott over here in oh. NRC. Could I elaborate on that co yes. public yes. comment part? Um, yesterday we published our Federal Register notice that it offers that opportunity, and, and I just wanted to make sure you know that it's the, the website to do that is uh, www.regulations.gov, and you use the docket uh, number NRC-2017-012. Um, and all that information is in the Federal Register Notice. I don't know if it's, if it's possible, if you could put that Federal Register Notice maybe on your website, it might make it easier for people to find information. Yes, we will. We'll put that on this. Um, our panel has a site on the State of Vermont's website located on the Public Service Department's site. Um, and what we'll do is we'll make sure that that link is on it and I'll make sure that we email out um, to everybody what that email addresses and what the link is. So we'll, we'll push the information out as much as we can so that everybody has that information. Um, there was a question earlier about where people can find the slides from tonight's presentations, and there are two places. Entergy has a website, vydecommissioning.com, and again, it's also on the State of Vermont's Public Service Department website, and the Nuclear Decommissioning Citizens Advisor Panel has our own site there. Um, so if you're looking for that, you can find it. Um, the meeting will be rebroadcast on BCTV if you want to watch it on your television or you can see it anytime online. So anything you want to, you can rewatch the meeting at two in the morning if you, if you have nothing else to do and you can't sleep. Um, I want to thank before we, before um, we do a little bit more housekeeping on the panel, I do want to thank the representatives from um, the NRC for coming, and I want to thank um, Scott State and Mike Toomey for coming. Um, we appreciate it very much, and I think somebody said this may be the last time we ever see the NRC, um, and I don't think that's true because there are other issues that are going to be coming up, and I had a conversation with them um, prior to this meeting, and there may be um, other reasons for them to come up and fill us in on what's going on. Um, so we, we appreciate that offer as well. The next um, NDCAP meeting is 
At this point, scheduled for June 22nd, we have um, confirmed that representatives from Holtec, they are the company that is doing the transferring of the fuel from the spent fuel pool to the second dry cast storage pad. They have confirmed that they will be coming to the meeting. We also have confirmation that representatives from Ariva, which is one of the um, partners with North Star, um, will be coming to the meeting. There's a, a, a chance, based on everybody's schedule, we're dealing with a lot of people, that that meeting may be pushed back a week. Um, and this is news to some people in the room here, so I apologize for springing it on you. Um, so I'm gonna be sending a, an email out to the panel and to all the people that are impacted if we change the date and see if that's a changeable date or not. And what we do for all of you here is we um, post all the information, the days and times and places of our meetings, again, on the State of Vermont website. And um, we also email it out so we get it out as um, much as possible. So tentatively put June 22nd, but it may be bumped back a week depending on the logistics of, of doing that. I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants to say anything before we adjourn our meeting. No, everybody's going, no. Um, so again, I want I'm to I'm sorry, say that again, Madam Chair. Does anyone want to say anything before we adjourn the meeting? Yes. Oh, yes. We gotta give you a microphone, Senator. Madam Chair, um, public policy and decisions of this sort are best made when there are the clear rules of what happens in the future. And the NRC's job, or the Congress's job, is to make clear who is responsible if such this goes forward. Many of us, including myself, would like to see the money spent sooner rather than later. If the NRC is not telling us who's responsible if a good faith project comes up short, and the answer is, we'll find out when it happens, what use is the NRC? Does anyone else on the panel want to make a comment? Kate. Yes, Steve. Yes, I'd, I'd like to say something. Kate, if I could, thank you. Skibniowski here. Um, I'd like to uh, just uh, certainly thank all the panelists and uh, NRC that uh, are here this evening. But I would also like to remind the panelists that um, during the presentations, during the public comments and so forth, um, it would be most courteous to uh, refrain from talking and, and uh, essentially ignoring what the individuals are saying until they're finished speaking. And uh, I, I think it's a <clears throat> matter of common courtesy in a public forum like this, and I would like to remind all of my fellow panelists that <clears throat> that at least is the type of protocol that I'm um, familiar with and uh, would certainly support in the future. Thank you, Steve. Any other comments or questions from anyone on the panel? All right, again, thank you all for coming. David Andrews has made the motion to adjourn. Does anyone second that motion? Second. Everybody seconds that motion. All those in favor? We're adjourning, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming.